Yeah, hi everyone. <laughs> Can you hear me, Mr. Tokwe? Yeah, I can hear you now. Great, great. Loyster, how you? Hey. Great to have you on board, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But budget is up, is on too, and then yeah, I can see Tayo too. Um, okay. We have, okay. Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, we have one panelist still. We're supposed to join Miriam. Okay. I, I think we should just give her like two minutes. So thank you, um, participants, for joining. Um, we'll be starting in about a minute. Just trying to ensure that we have all our panelists. Um, Okay, um, I think we're gonna start. I can see we have um, quite some participants already. Oh, Miriam, here, you're here. Hey. Hi, I'll be Hey, hi, Babajide. Miriam, are you, are you there? Okay, are you welcome? Hi, Biodo. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming around. Um, we have Miriam was trying to join too. Okay. I'm not sure why she's having. Just one minute to see if we can send us some chats um, on the group. Okay. All right, Miriam should be on now. Miriam? Okay, good. All right, a complete house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mic check. I'm sure everybody can hear me loud and clear. Very good, yes. very good. I can hear you. Okay, okay hello, good. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. 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 Okay, so um, I'm just going to do a, um, a brief introduction and then I'll allow the panelists to take turns um, to introduce themselves. So um, Tokwa would go first, Afri Labs, and then we have Tayo with for good next. Um, Ayode will go next to introduce himself for three minutes. Ayo Dawodu, Loyster, Babajide, FCMB, and Miriam will go next. Um, so thank you guys for joining. We have actually over 120 participants subscribed for this session, even though we're supposed to have just 100. <laughs> so um, we look forward to this meeting session. So I want to say thank you to all um, our panelists from different parts of the world, majorly from Nigeria, from Abuja to Lagos, and also from Finland and Sinki. Miriam, thanks for joining too. Oh, Sinki is about, I, right now, I think it's 10 p.m. in Helsinki. Am I right? It's 9 p.m. We're it's, it's 9 p.m. So yeah. thank you for, for, for joining. Um, I mean, we all know what the deal is. And um, the idea of this session is to, you know, put a bit of um, substance into what is going on um, around the world with respect to COVID-19. Um, everybody knows it has come to change the game. And so this discussion is to see how with all of the policies and all of um, you know the back and forth happening globally, what does this present for startups? And on that level, we're going to be looking at three major elements. We're going to be discussing about the challenges, um, trying to understand exactly what this means for startups in terms of the problems that are being faced for startups and young entrepreneurs or small businesses. And then we're going to look into you know adaptation strategies. So we're going to be looking at what can we do while we are still in COVID. What 
lessons can startups begin to pick to pivot themselves and also reposition themselves? Are there business models to learn from? Are there um, you know, strategies to be able to cope with this and not to lose their clients or market completely? And then we're gonna tie that up with the last part, which is the opportunities post COVID-19. And so for that, we're gonna be discussing our panelists will be telling us what exactly is to be expected with every crisis comes opportunities. And so we have seasoned experts in the room who will be telling us when COVID ends, just like every other pandemic ends, um, new opportunities will be coming around different industries. There'll be insights. And so the idea would be for us to be able to glean from your experiences and your case studies to know exactly what we should do as startups, what we should do as business owners, once um, COVID is done. So that's how we're going to take, um, you know, and then we're probably going to have a few minutes for questions and answers to see, um, you know, we'll see how far that can take us and then we'll call it a day. So um, my, I mean, starting for myself, I'm Biodun um, Dunuga. I'm the co-founder for Friends of Nigeria. And that's an organization based in France, a diaspora organization that fosters socioeconomic relations between France and Nigeria. I'm also the project manager for the Nigerian France Tech Initiative launched by the Embassy of Nigeria in Paris to ensure that both countries collaborate on tech projects, investments related um, issues to well, as it comes to startups. So I'm going to go right into introduction and allow Tokwe after labs to introduce himself and then we'll take our turns before we dive into the subject for today. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Timmy Tokwe. Ishedo, and uh, my surname means that if you work, you make money. So it's a kind of interesting surname. <laughs> so uh, I'm the director of programs at AfriLabs. AfriLabs is um, a pan-African network of tech hubs. Um, I don't know how much you know about what tech hubs are, but tech hubs are like uh, centers, innovation centers, uh, co-working spaces, you know, uh, that support entrepreneurs and startups to you know build their business to grow their business or to scale their business it depends on um, for that uh, for the category of support they offer so we have different archetypes of tech hubs so africa is the largest of social network in africa we currently we have about 200 members spread across 45 african african countries so my work includes a lot of traveling you know i have to you know travel across the continent to meet uh, our community. So it's an exciting work. Uh, it also includes not just working with the tech hubs, but building programs, you know, uh, to work directly with the startups and our partners to uh, help young people in Africa. So that's essentially uh, my introduction. Oh, I should say that our secretariat is in Abuja, Nigeria. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Yes. Good evening. Can I go? Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Timmy Tai. Great to meet everyone, by the way, um, both the speakers as well as the participants. Um, my name is Timmy Tai Peters. I'm the founder and CEO of We for Good International. It's a sustainable development um, focused on communications programs. Um, uh, communication training and programs um, geared towards the achievement of the development goals in Africa. We have as a mission to build a new crop of leaders, um, African leaders who are, we run programs with organizations, so we partner with organizations who are very driven along the lines of innovation. Before starting We For Good, um, I was um, in the corporate space for about um, 15 years. So I worked in banks, I worked at Access Bank, I worked at um, FCNB, I can see Baba Jide, um, Ashibeli. <laughs> so I worked at FCNB, I worked, uh, my last corporate um, um, endeavor was with the Nigerian Stock Exchange as head of corporate social responsibility. Um, with We For Good, we work with young entrepreneurs, so we run fellowship programs. We actually ran a fellowship program last year, which we're also still running right now. The Sustainable Solutions um, Africa Project focused on helping young people 
um, to you know young social entrepreneurs, supporting them with skills, with coaching, with funding. And we're actually able to get um, funding, you know, of about um, three million naira for each of our fellows um, um, last year, and we're going to do that again uh, this year. You know, so basically um, that's what we do. So we run programs, and our focus is on Africa and on, on its sustainable development, really, because. I don't want to go into the program, but you know, um, it's a lot of, when you look at the challenges facing this continent, um, it's huge. So it's something we all need to put our hands on and see how we move forward on it. And so I'm very excited about this um, program tonight because I think it's going to help us deal with a lot with um, some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ayo, Ayo Dick, you're next. Okay, sure. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Biodun, first for for inviting me on this call. Uh, thanks for the privilege. Um, I'm Ayo. I work as an agency business manager at Google, based in Nigeria. Um, basically, I handle everything that has to do with partnership, sales, and commercials with uh, some of our advertising partners across Africa. Um, I also have a big, big interest in startups. Uh, so I invest in a few startups. I'm on the board on the few startups and. Um, I basically advise them. So as you can imagine, this period is really tricky and really scary for, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of the startups. Um, outside of that, also very passionate about digital and digital transformation. Um, everything that is happening in the world is sad. Um, you know, uh, we wish otherwise, uh, but you know, as, ob as obvious as it is, um, you know, digital as a platform has been one that everybody has been relying on. And so, you know, I hear quite a lot of people that, you know, say, imagine, if this crisis that's happening today was happening, say, 20 years ago. Um, you know, the technology we have today uh, to rely on, to work, to keep in touch with our families and friends wasn't really, um, it wasn't really existing at the scale that it currently is, and it's going to be much difficult for us to, to cope. Um, so, you know, this, this is a field, field I'm really passionate about. Um, and yeah, looking forward to an interesting discussion, looking forward to your questions, and hope, you know, hopefully we can share as much insight as possible. Thank you, Hayori. Thank you, Miriam. Hello. Um, great to meet you all. And once again, thank you, Biodun, for uh, inviting me to participate. And uh, very thrilled to see uh, so many people interested in this in this talk. It's definitely uh, very timely. Perhaps more so for for startups who are just sort of finding their finding their footing and finding their product fit and and so forth. Um, my background is in uh, strategy and um, new business development, especially uh, focused on um, new business model, uh, innovative business model, um, and, and in innovative value creation and so forth. Um, and the segment that I've been especially focused in is, of course, uh, social impact uh, companies and education technology uh, startups, particularly. Uh, both from the uh, public sector's point of view and then from private companies' point of view. So that means in practice, uh, we've designed programs, for example, for Ministry of Education um, in, in different parts of Africa in how they can implement uh, digital tools into their teaching practices. And uh, the focus especially is not just using uh, digital technology because it's the sexy thing, but how can we create uh, learning paradigms that will help to reach meaningful learning outcomes, uh, combining uh, the, the innovative practices or teacher training practices uh, and sort of supercharging that with technology. So it's very contextual. Um, uh, redesign of education, if you will, um, and then also similar things in uh, vocational education and in in higher education digital tr uh, digital transformation. Um, so now is sort of the happening time <laughs> uh, for all of this. I, I would say that many of the of the companies who've already uh, done some work with us have done this groundwork of digital transformation are definitely benefiting from it now. So when you think that many parents are having to uh, many kids are at home and they they have to use some digital learning tools or or university students some of them have had to pause their education uh, simply because you know the universities are not set up with infrastructures uh, to continue continue their education uh, for them so so these are the mm, specific sector uh, that I've sort of focused my strategy uh, work on so far. Thank you, Miriam. Um, Babajidi, over to you. 
Oh, okay. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Abiodun, for organizing this. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, being part of this. Um, so basically, um, I work for FCMB. Uh, I've been at FCMB uh, for the past eight years. Uh, before then, I was uh, worked a bit at telecoms, then a bit at uh, consulting. Uh, but basically, core of my career has been built in FCMB. Um, where I've spent most of my time in electronic payments and collections. Um, so basically digital banking, um, engagement with financial technology companies. Um, and in the last two years, um, I set up the bank's desk, uh, the tech ecosystem business desk, um, which has basically focused on our engagement with the tech ecosystem. Um, so tech ecosystem to us meaning tech startups, um, venture capitalists that fund technology, government agencies that support tech, um, and the entire pool of um, the technology companies. Um, for us, um, it was an important strategy uh, because we believed that the future SMEs would be tech startups. Um, now, COVID-19 has validated that, um, that to add value or deliver value to your customer, you must sort of infuse um, the digital marketplace. Um, you must transform yourself from being an, a manual enterprise to becoming a digital enterprise. Um, and that's what I've been doing in the last two years, um, engaging tech ops. And we have ours um, that I also set up, Obron, uh, which is somewhere in Yaba, uh, which is where I sit most of the time. Um, and I'm excited by this opportunity to learn from others um, as we rob minds. Um, I know that um, for scenarios like COVID that people classify as force majeure, um, you never know the future. You can just prepare as much as you can. And, and, and I would like to learn and, and mingle with everyone. So thanks once again for the opportunity. Thank you, Babajude. Ayo, <laughs> over to you. All right. Um, can you guys hear me? And then Loud and clear. I just want to share my audience. Right. Yes. So I'm, I'm just doing the outdoor webinar today because, I mean, I've been on a streak of webinars in the last, so like two weeks, <laughs> hosting and being a part of, so today I said, let me get off my PC and just stay out there. So that's why you find me outside. Beautiful. Anyway, my name is Ayo Daudu. Um, I lead the team at Loyster. I'm the CEO right there. And in the last couple of years, say from 2016, I've been in the startup space. Um, but after that, um, my career sort of, by the way, I, got, I have a background in computer science. I'm, I'm a technical person. Um, but I got started into this startup space um, in 2014 with a, with a three-day workshop called the Lean Startup Machine. And what we did for about 50, 50, sorry, 50 plus founders was to sort of in three days validate their ideas and see if whatever they were trying to do was viable in the market rather than you trying to launch a product or come up with an idea and then in say six months, 12 months, you realize that it's not going to work. But then you must have wasted money, wasted time, mm -hmm. and then you end up at, back at square one. So that was my current startup space. Um, that went successfully well. And I was going to apply sort of what we did in that workshop. Um, so I was going to say, okay, I was also here and I wanted to start out. And then taking the lean startup process and trying to come up with a product, um, that's how come I started Loyster. And so Loyster is a retail loyalty platform and uh, we've been around for about four years now we work with small businesses in retail we provide them with a point of sale solution um a solution that sort of takes care of everything that has to do with tracking their sales inventory management um running your loyalty programs keeping track of customers um so people that use our software think of a restaurant a fashion boutique who have physical stores they could also sell online. They could, they could have e-commerce websites. Uh, so what, what we've done essentially is to sort of integrate all of their sales channel into one platform. So whether you're selling offline 
we are selling online, you have one view to all the records. And in the light of the old COVID-19 um, situation, we've seen some interesting dynamics. Yeah. So we have merchants that have only physical locations, and we have merchants that have both physical and online um, sales channels. It was very interesting to just watch how everything happened. We definitely know that for everyone, the experience is down on in sales and everything. But for certain kind of businesses, which are in the like essential categories, say, for example, food, it was very interesting to see that they were making sales, right? And they were making sales through their online channels because they had, before COVID, invested in digital infrastructure. So while they had a physical location, they could also take orders online. And so it was just a switch for them. And even that, it was even much more than, so it, maybe pre-COVID, pre they were getting, say, 70% walk-in and then 30% um, sales from online. But during this COVID, we've now seen all of the sales coming online. And it just made us think and try to see, okay, for these guys that are making sales, there are some that are not even making sales at all. And so our own way of responding to that is sort of, which is what I had on my, um, so if I thought of my camera, there's an artwork. We came up with a solution called Chow. And essentially what we're doing is aggregating all of the food merchants on the Loyster platform and trying to curate their products and present them to customers or present them to users that might need food during this period. We all know that you can't go on the road and try to access the groceries or try to buy anything. So this is just one way we are responding and innovating around what we've done to sort of make the best of this situation. Beautiful. I'm very excited to be on this panel and um, I hope to share more as, as time progresses. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, everyone. And I, I, I think we've already started already. I just shed some light. So like we said, the session is divided into three. We're going to look at the challenges being faced by businesses. We're going to look at the adaptation strategies, and then we're going to round up on the good notes opportunities. And so, I mean, I won't bore you with too much statistics, but it's good to lay an emphasis that currently the World Bank has already given an, you know, a forecast to say Africa as a whole or Sub-Saharan Africa will be experiencing a downward growth from 2.4% in 2019 to minus 2.1 or to 5, minus 5.1 in 2020. And beyond that also, McKinsey has also come to say the continent is likely to lose about 90 to 20 billion dollars, 90 to 200 billion dollars, sorry. And Nigeria, if we're going to go deep, deeper down with Nigeria, for instance, if the virus or COVID is contained, Marquise is saying there is a chance that we'll be able to just lose $20 billion this year. But if we don't contain this even as a country, there is a likelihood that we're going to lose about $40 billion. And also another last fact, Chinese investors who are also very prominent in the tech ecosystem. From the past, about 50% of them have dropped investments in the first quarter of the year. And what forecast is saying is that because of the pull out of investments from the Chinese side, into the tech ecosystem. The tech ecosystem of startups in the world globally would lose about $28 billion because China also represents a major part of the investments. So we're gonna start with the challenges first and I would like to ask um, Ayo, Ayode, um, to place this in perspective, all of these statistics, how does this make sense to startups? What are the real problems being faced by young entrepreneurs right now and startups in about two minutes? Uh, so I think this, this time is, it, we're literally in a period where there's an existential threat to mm -hmm. most startups. Um, I saw a tweet today that I thought was interesting, uh, by, uh, the guy that owns tech point. He says, uh, running a startup, you must be mad. And then running a startup in Nigeria and Africa, then you must be raving mad. Right. So like on just a regular day, it's really challenging to, to run a startup here in this market uh, for several reasons, right? The market is unforgiving, consumers are fickle, very limited spending power, um, very limited access to capital, ETC. Uh, so there's the regular challenges that you'd find every other day, right? Um, and then with the COVID-19, it's disrupted the space like never before. And so essentially what you find is that literally most startups are in a period where they're trying to, um, you know, maintain their survival, right? So you'd find that a lot of them are um, cutting costs, freezing every possible expenses, uh, reviewing their 
2020 forecast, um, you know, looking at uh, pessimistic and realistic scenarios and ensuring that it can survive. Um, a few of them are trying to find low cost financing where possible. Uh, what you're also finding with um, investors is that most investors are also maintaining a holding pattern with regards to their invest investment, right? So, um, you know, it's not even a case where they are, li they are really prioritizing investment as it were. It's literally let's wait and see because um, what's happening is, is really unprecedented. Uh, we don't know how long this would last. There are a few forecasts that says, you know, uh, things will start to slow down towards the end of May um, or towards the end of June going to July. Um, but they are also the same forecast also says that there's probably going to be you know cases of reinfection um, towards the later part of summer and we're going to have this you know up and down um, 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 diagram throughout the year so it's really challenging um, and uh, as far as i'm concerned with most startups um, it's, it's a case of trying to ensure that we stay alive um, which you know we think is going to be really challenging however um, what we're also saying is that um, startups that already exist in the digital space um, are finding opportunities in, in this era. Uh, you know, so, you know, we think e-commerce is going to be the clear winner locally. I know we're already seeing that with Amazon, um, but very few startups have the supply and logistic capacity um, that the likes of the Amazons have. You know, so while your business might be e and e-commerce, you still rely on traditional supply chains to fulfill um, those services, both on the supply and, and on, on the um, delivery side of things. So even for e-commerce startups, it's quite challenging. However, you find that startups that, are, that play more around the software um, side of things are finding more interest because, you know, um, businesses, individuals, institutions, schools, hospitals, ETC, um, are scrambling to set up their, you know, their digital capacity and digital presence. So um, you know, a, a few of the startups I'm involved with have shown a lot of interest, interestingly, more from the medical side of things. So you're finding a lot of hospitals and pharmacies and other healthcare related um, um, institutions um, scrambling to set up their online presences, offer consultancies, um, you know, um, services, deliveries, digital, digital channels. Um, which is yeah, just, just a comment. Out. We're going to make this as attractive as possible. Oh, okay. um, you, did, you did a series on Twitter. Um, I was yes. still on you. And okay. actually, on this, you know, adapting to COVID 19. And I think you were talking about one of the tweets actually has this like, you can be lean and adaptable. And this is a great competitive advantage for a startup. You tweeted right. that some days ago on how startups can, you know, cope adapting to this. So, what did you mean by you could be lean and adaptable and that's your advantage as a startup? What did you mean by that? Uh, so essentially, my thinking there was that you'd find that a lot of startups, uh, while very few are creating very new um, industries and solutions, most of them exist in um, industries that you know already have traditional players, even large players. Um, and you find that with those kind of industries, so for instance, um, the very closest to me is uh, in the areas of advertising. So in my role at Google, I work with a lot of traditional advertising agencies across Africa. Um, and what you're finding now is that there are a lot of layoffs happening already in these agencies because, for instance, one of their biggest media channels is outdoor, right? Okay. Uh, but with everybody isolated in the house, there is no outdoor advertising to be sold. Um, however, if you look at um, startups that, you know, offer, say, digital marketing services, e-commerce services, ETC, um, they can still maintain a relatively small workforce, relatively um, lean setup, um, and still offer those services. So. Uh, the you know and, and I like that I made reference to the lean startup when he started. Um, this is an opportunity for startups to stay lean, um, mm -hmm. and that in itself is a competitive advantage over traditional players who uh, you know have big workforce, big capital, sure. and all of these other things that make a lot of demands on their resources. Thank you so much, Ayo. Now going to talk about um, Afri Labs. Afri Labs, it's a very great platform. You guys have been doing a terrific job. And most of your partners are not just incubators that you actually offer support for. You also deal with investors, you deal with um, governmental agencies. What's the feel from the market when it comes to how all of these partners are going to be able to help startups adapt during the COVID um, pandemic? So what's the feel with respect to venture capitalists, to investors, and I mean, for Afrilabs as a whole? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I have to start my answer by saying that uh, um, we as a community, 
we are experiencing something that we have never ever yeah. seen. And, and, you know, we are totally closed down. You know, we are tech hubs. We are physical spaces with a lot of SMEs and entrepreneurs in our spaces. Everybody, they are closed down. So we are not just dealing with closed hubs. We are dealing with closed startups and SMEs that have yeah. to work for more. Yes. So uh, we have had to summon a lot of partnerships, you know, in trying to help these people that are going to be dealing, for example, our species are going to be dealing with a lot of staff that are going to get paid. And if the startups and SMEs that are occupying the space are not paying for those species, it mm -hmm. becomes a really big crisis. Now, our investors, okay, uh, the investors, they depend on us a lot. Okay. In, for example, as a connection between what the startups are actually doing or they yes. have on ground, you know, and them, because uh, if you look at how the investment ecosystem in Africa is set up, a lot of investment, in fact, most of the investment coming into the ecosystem is coming from abroad, you know, it's coming from overseas. And so they, they rely heavily on the people that are here to do that. So with a lot of, you know, closed spaces and startups at home and all that, we have had a situation where investors are really, really holding back. Now, for the ones, the ones that are actually responding are the ones that are not for profit investors. Okay. You know, uh, you know, D development, DFIs and donors, you know, grant makers and all that, who are actually trying to say that um, we uh, we give grants, you know, or we give some free money, you know, to these uh, startups and the, these, um, you know, SMEs. But yeah. now that COVID-19 has come, we can see that we can give them some money, you know, to, to try and support them to adapt whatever their solutions are, whatever their products and businesses are to the realities on yeah. ground. Okay, so these are the ones that we are actually seeing some increased interest from yeah. with respect to the ecosystem. Um, for the past few days, God knows how many meetings I've had with, from African Development Bank, you know, to uh, defeat funded projects like the largest education technology project in the world. We've seen partners who are actually focused on so on specific sectors like education, like finance, like all these things, saying that we are actually have we have to respond to COVID-19. And even for DFIT, for example, DFIT was giving us uh, the leeway to say that we can devote 25% of our time on the project to respond to COVID-19. Yeah. So um, yeah, so this also means that you know funds that were um, you know uh, allocated to other things. We've had a situation where we have been told to actually directly to response to COVID-19. We are running a project with AFD and AFD is agreeing that you have to, it doesn't do well, you know, for our, uh, our public yeah. image, for you to just go on as if COVID-19 is not happening. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you have to actually respond to COVID-19, include it as the for, at the forefront of your response of, of, to the project, you know, and all that. So there's a lot of encouragement from the development sector from donors, from grants, you know, but from the for-profit sector, we are seeing because it's actually profit. Yeah. You know, it's this is profit to them. So we are seeing some kind of drawback. Yeah. Uh, at this point, because Africa is not the epicenter of COVID-19 yet. Okay. Yeah. At this point, there is still some the, the station is not as bad as we yeah. expect. Yeah. yeah. Now, but it is there's no, I have I'm not seeing really any positive thing right now with respect to investment because it is coming now. Wow. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That Talk about investments. Um, Tayo, during our, our own For We For Good, mentioned that, I mean, every last year she, she runs um, under the platform a project called Sustainable Solution Africa, where she selects about 30 young people in across Africa who are doing great stuff and to support them. And she already mentioned, and um, that's for the I mean, participants to actually get something from that, that this year they'll still repeat the same feats and give 3 million naira to people they choose. So, they are not bankrupt, you know. COVID is not stopping me for good for doing that. But I want to ask, beyond the three million, they are going to be supporting young entrepreneurs with how? What would what, what do you think about adapting strategies before? Because COVID is the, the hope is this will end soon, but between now and when it ends, how are your startups faring, and what are the strategies you think they could use to adapt right now and not go off the market completely? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for, for, for to the speakers who have spoken ahead. 
Um, you know, so while we were speaking, you know, you had mentioned the challenges. So I actually wrote down um, two challenges that I could immediately see. Um, so first is around economic challenges, you know, which is what we've spoken about. You know, the economic challenges. We are talking about invest um, your the spenders. Who are those that? Um, can you hear me? Sure, loud and clear. Because my internet was saying it's not stable. So we're also then talking about the, the, the people who buy from you, like the spenders, the people who use you, your users, the users of startups. Because if um, they are having economic challenges, then it's definitely going to affect their spending. Sure. Sure. You know? So of course, um, everyone has always known that when it comes to food, Food never goes out of um, <laughs> out of out of fashion or out of style, you know. Um, so there's a Yoba adage that says that hunger doesn't get into the stomach, and another thing gets into it. You know, once hunger is there, it has to be dealt with. There's another funny one that says that um, I can't be hungry. I can't if I've not washed my inside. I can't wash my outside. Oh, yeah. You know. So, but then there are so many other businesses uh, doing some so many other things. But then, you know, so I wrote an article just uh, recently on Tikidia of uh, Professor um, Ekekwe, you know, around opportunities, you know, the opportunities for Africa, you know, around this COVID and then um, all of that. We all know the kind of markets that, um, that we operate in Africa. Across yeah. Africa, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of like daily spending, you know, people go out every day and they don't even know where the money is going to come from for that day yet. Some people don't eat before they go out, especially talking about the women on the channel. You know, all these things cascade, you know, like when they talk about, oh, they've increased fuel prices or pump price or whatever. You might still pump price, but then it's going to affect immediately the woman who is in the market says, oh, the transport fare that I'm going to use to buy this stuff from, um, from mile 12 has increased. And so that has to go into what I'm selling. And then the person who is buying it or whoever, you know, so the, it just cascades. And this, that's the thing that's going to happen here, here in terms of the economic challenges that startups are going to have to face because spending is going to drop um, apart from the, those coming investors, but even from those that are, you are dealing with, you know, so like the essentials and things that people, another um, challenge that I wrote down here and which now, um, you know, trails directly into what you've mentioned is about adaptation challenges that's another key challenge so i was a mentor for the global hack um, that was just concluded so we had this uh, the global hack you know um i think from estonia and all of these uh, okay. people so we tried to create a hackathon around um, one thing that, even though the hackathon was directly around um, covid 19 um, and those that I mentored, I wanted them to look outside of COVID-19, you know, going forward, um, what next and all of that. But you could actually see that there was, and that's what, um, what um, uh, Temi Tope, you know, mentioned about the fact that there's a lot of focus, you know, around COVID-19 right now. And everyone wants you to just like try to yeah. put some focus on it. That's like an adaptation challenge, you know, like, so for startups, startups begin to look at things like, okay, so how do I bring up the uh, question of COVID-19 into what I'm doing, even though I'm not in the health space or I'm not in this uh, space, I'm not in the, you know, I'm not in that, um, how do you call it, maybe emergency space as it were. So how do I, how does COVID-19 fit into what I'm doing without sounding um, kind of cheeky, you know, around it, you know, and so that's a, that's a challenge that we need to look at as well. So how, how do they begin to look at these things? So if you're, you're, you're in your space, what, what can you do? You know, so I'm going to straight into the adaptation strategies and the thing that I've been thinking about is, you know, um, and this is a thought that has been with me for quite some time now that at the end of the day, everything still boils down to the people. Okay. It boils down to people, you know. So, you know, um, I was just thinking, you know, around this and I said some of the challenges that a lot of um, startups will face right now is around their ideas, you know, because um, startup passion, um, passion is, is very important. It's very essential. Without passion, of course, you can't, you can't even move forward. Somebody quoted, 
um, the tech point CEO saying that um, you know to be to be a, to to run a startup you have to be mad and it to run one in Nigeria you have to be extremely mad. It only means you have to be like extremely passionate, you know, like crazy, you know, like the way people ask me, are you crazy? Why did you leave your job? You know, like leave your job as the head of corporate social responsibility in a place like the Nigerian Stock Exchange and say you want to come and start pushing you want a funny startup here and there you know so but then a lot of a lot of um, um, a lot of startups are passionate about their ideas and that may be a challenge at this time it may actually pose a challenge your passion as much as you should have passion your passion should be on the people it should be on the people and not as in this time, not on the idea so that you get boxed into your idea so that you can open up um, your mind because that's where adaptation starts from. It starts from thinking about the people. So what next for people right now? Not what, what next for people right now? And how does my startup fit into what next for people? Because now we're talking about, um, we're talking about, um, so we, we spoke about brick and mortar um, organizations, you know, the next thing for people is that People are going to be going online more. So how does it find your business? This is why you created You wanted to have that feel of brick and mortar where people come together and do all of that. That's cool and that's nice. But then this is what is next for people right now. You're in love with your idea, but what next for people? Right now, people are going to be moving online. And so we need to go drill down. We might not be able to deal with all of that right now in this space, but each individual, each startup has to go down into your business model and look at it and say, okay, so what next for my users right now? You have to get into their shoes. What next for them? This was what I used to offer them before. This was what we used to do together. What next for them? For example, like what Temi Tucker was saying about Afri Labs. Okay, so this is it. We, we, you had a space. I also have a space, you know, I have a space that we've invested in, we've done everything, and it's right there right now. And my landlord is still going to collect our money, you know, she's not going to oh, yeah. say because of this and all of that, you know. So, but so what next? What next for the people, you know? So, um, that's th those that will be, I think, for me, that's what we should really sit on, you know, looking at all other aspects. That what's what next for the people? How do I plug into yeah. what is next for the people? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Sayo. Um, what next for the people? Miriam, um, based in Finland, so you work a lot with um, startups. They could be owned by African founders, also European founders. Um, are there skills or strategies to learn from that side of the world and that can be replicated to startups, probably in Africa, in Nigeria, that could help them with adapting to the present COVID. So what are, what are the, you know, the day-to-day -day experience you have with living startups wherever you are, I mean, in Finland, and how, how are you able to put the perspective of dealing with COVID-19 challenge, and how does that fit into um, something um, our startups from Africa can learn from to adapt right now? Thank you. That's a very um, interesting question. Um, I have to start off by saying that um, Everyone's facing the same challenges right now uh, all over the world, although uh, the tools that different people have to deal with it are a little bit different. So you might know that in Europe, for example, many countries have announced palliative measures and uh, funding available for businesses and companies. You know, uh, some, for example, with, with rent, for instance, there are many countries where government owned infrastructure, they're saying, you know what, no rent for the next three months and banks are suspending mortgages. So the tools are a little bit different, but I think that um, in the long run, even those who have this better palliative tool, it's not going to save them. Uh, it's it's only going to be a bit of a band aid, and and I, exactly what you were talking about, um, Timmy Tyler. That's that's really the 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 crux of of my point here today that I've been thinking on and discussing very much with other uh, strategic uh, pr uh, strategy practitioners and 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 uh, global thought leaders. Is this uh, you called it? Um, what did you call it? Adaptation strategy. Um, uh, another word for it is also strategic agility. So. So you're, you're very right. But the first thing that the question, the question, the startups uh, need to be asking themselves, because if there's one thing uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, time and this pause is giving us is a lot of time for reflection. Um, so I think the first question they should ask is, is my business idea still valid? 
right? Like, is it valid right now? And is it re valid in the long term? Um, so there, there's, there are two, two things to keep very much in mind is how do I survive now? And how do I thrive in the post COVID-19 world? And these are, you know, there can be slightly, two slightly different scenarios for that. For example, um, demand for certain things has gone down now because people are saving their money. Uh, people aren't spending as much or people don't have as much to spend because people are losing jobs and, and, and all, many other, many other, other things. But, you know, after we all come out and we are let loose, uh, the spending um, um, abilities will change a little bit. People will be uh, in different parts of the world. It will uh, grow at different rate, but people will start to, to spend a little bit more. Uh, but now comes the challenge of, of supply of goods and services. Let's, let's talk about Nigeria, for example. Things are certainly not looking very good, not only because of COVID-19, but also because of the falling oil, oil uh, prices and so forth. So it creates a scenario of, you know, there's less foreign exchange to spend. That means if you're someone who's importing uh, resources for your startup or importing goods from abroad or in importing uh, parts and things like that, raw materials, uh, you're going to face some really stringent um, issues in terms of how you can how you can source. Or there are some businesses, for example, who are completely shut down. So uh, travel agencies, for example, you know, uh, they have a they still have a, a long way. You know, they're suffering uh, a great deal here. So this is the question that the startups you must ask yourself is that is my idea still valid anymore? And and uh, what can I do to change that scenario? And you are very very spot on there. Uh, Timmy Sokwe is that you cannot be in love with your idea. And there, there are essentially yeah. two strategic tools at your disposal, right? Um, one is the resource-based approach uh, that you could use, uh, which, which is saying that what are the capabilities that I have right now? Um, you know, if I am a restaurant, I have equipment and things like that. So how can I repurpose what I have now uh, to, you know, offer a different type of service, right? Uh, do I start renting out my, my tools or what do I do with them? What, what um, human capacity you have, do you have? What data do you have? What knowledge uh, do you have uh, in your company that you can repurpose to serve other, other means right now, given this uh, state of things? And then another thing is, of course, the positioning uh, strategy, which is very much looking at your context. So what are the sort of hot commodity now? Right. What are the hot commodity mm -hmm. going to be uh, in, in the coming years? Uh, there's, there are projections that uh, there will be strong levels of what they call um, localization. So because of this COVID-19, there'll be travel restrictions. Companies will, uh, countries will contract. So this is sort of the opposite of globalization because many companies who are relying on global supply chain, if you're supplying to a company in Germany as your business, then they'll, they'll, you know, they'll contract. They'll say that, you know, we have to uh, keep the core um, resources that we need to keep our economy running. We have to keep them in the country, right? So that means that yeah. you on the other end of the world are going, to, are going to suffer for that. So then you start to say then how do I, can I be a part of developing demand, right, in the local market that I am in? Uh, for the product and services that I'm offering. So then you start to look, it's, very, it's a very much contextual exercise, right? And that's where innovation uh, comes in a little bit. Not only innovation in the product, uh, the things, the end thing that you produce, uh, but also in the way that you make money off of the things that you produce. Right. And when I'm talking about innovation here, I'm not talking about invention uh, because innovation itself uh, really is about making money. It's about capturing value from resources or, or ideas yeah. that have, yeah. been, have been created. So, so these, are the, these are the things that um, uh, many of the startups really need to start, start thinking about, that how can they take advantage from this uh, resource point of view? And of course, you don't need to choose one, right? Like that's the 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 crux of the matter in this COVID-19 time is that the ones who are going to succeed are the ones who are going to be able to do both, both looking at their resources and positioning uh, very strategically. Um, and of course, as they say, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating of the pudding, right? You, something is delicious only when you've tasted it. It doesn't matter how it looks. So then comes your execution. How fast can you move? Because you have to know that you, this is a very competitive race now, and there are many people 
are looking to the same area that you're looking to. I think everyone who, who has any awareness now should know that agriculture is one place to be um, right now, for example, or uh, yeah. digital tools or e-learning tools or online entertainment um, or um, uh, online fitness programs, you know, all, all of this, this food, food, food um, delivery, uh, packaging goods, you know, because, you know, people are not able to go there and self-select anymore and they need these things uh, to be delivered. So everyone's looking at the same idea, right? Then comes how, how fast do you move? How fast do you respond? And I really like the point that Timmy Tucker talks about very much that not only can't you be in love with your idea uh, or, or your core um, um, uh, sort of startup product currently, you also can't be too in love with the processes that you have already established. Yeah. So it, it requires a lot of rethinking to say that if we are going to be doing value in a new way, if our customers are perceiving value in a new way, right? What are the processes that will allow us to really deliver and you know get the sort of customer loyalty that we need during this time? And, and, and that's very much about changing uh, your processes. So in, in summary, yes, you need to think fast, you need to, innovate on your your core business and how you deliver and you need to be very contextual thank you Br brilliant well captured miriam um, i'm going to jump straight to babajidi i mean you lead um the bank's innovative hub when it comes to dealing with startups at the fsmb hub one you interface directly with these startups and most of them right now at home what advice would you be able to give to startups right now to adopt you know, to adapt to the change right now. So that by the time we're resuming back, work and back to our normal lives, even some of your own startups in Obon under the FSMB umbrella would have not faced out. So what are the mm. adaptation strategies you think everybody needs right now right. so that they can survive this pandemic? Okay, thanks, Abiyod. And I think um, a good number of um, what I would have loved to share have been shared by Miriam, Ayo, Timmy Tokwe. Um, but what is also critical is to say that um, Startups need to understand that their businesses are um, what I would call a going concern. Um, mm -hmm. And when you perceive your business as a going concern, what that means is um, you need to come to terms to creating a business continuity plan. Um, so today it is COVID-19. Um, in 2022, it could just be an earthquake or COVID-20, you know, like, like I usually joke with my friends that it's 19 now, maybe there could be COVID-20 in two years' time. So what happens? So what that means is that startups um, need to understand that they have an huge advantage um, over brick and mortar institutions, even like a financial institution like myself. Um, because startups today, for example, in the financial space, are able to deliver financial services with less staff compared to a brick and mortar bank, fully with big branches, firing generators, with well, with a lot of internet, you know. So what that means is that startups must first understand that they have need to truly disrupt industries across the board. Um, that's one. Um, number two, I would say that um, adaptability is key. Um, and I think the Mitokwe did mention it to say that um, never be in love of your idea. Um, so be in love with um, the value you are creating and also see your startup business as a launch pad away from poverty. That is what I tell friend, my friends. You see, see your startup as a launch pad away from poverty. So what I'm saying in essence is if there are ideas that emerge from COVID-19 such as um, digital logistics, um, a bit of e-commerce, healthcare, you know, and a host of other things. 
I'll tell them, guys, my friend, please move into it. Um, never stay put. Um, it is clear that the world is ever evolving and consistently changing. Um, customer needs are evolving. Um, a good example is in banks. Um, I think 10, 15 years ago, I'm sure banks will not be interested in lifestyle. You know, but you have banks today that have invested a lot in marketplaces. You have banks that have huge investment in entertainment. Um, you have banks like myself that have huge investment in startups and most of other things. So what that tells you is that um, even the existing traditional institution are no longer in love with their traditional ideas. They are finding ways oh, yeah. of becoming like a chameleon, blending with the color of the environment. You know, so startups yeah. must learn to blend with the color of the environment. What is critical yeah. for them is to maintain integrity, to maintain ingenuity, yeah. to maintain value, um, to maintain a certain level of the pursuit of perfection. Um, so what I'm saying in essence is that when I engage some startups, you know, they will tell you, for example, that ah, I'm just in love with this kind of product. You know, some of them don't see themselves in food business. You know, I just don't like food business. Huh? But I'll tell a typical startup to say that it is clear that food is an essential commodity. Do you have the technical ability to partner with someone who is providing services in the food value chain, you know, oh, yeah. while you yeah. add some form of value and you partner, you know, because um, your business is for you to survive, you know. So survival first uh, before the other things, you know. And like Yobaz will say, you know, he's someone that his tummy is full that can start thinking of and they'll say beku beku or Thomas, something. You know, you, know, you, you know, you have to be okay. You know, um, and I think, um, and that, that's, that's, that's critical for us. So I'm talking from the African context and Nigerian context. Um, so um, outside of Africa, where um, guys have evolved to having interest in saving whales, saving sharks, saving frogs in the ponds, you know, and trying to save the world. In Africa, we are not at that point yet, <laughs> you know. So, so we need to come to the context to say, <laughs> if, if an African or a Nigerian sees a shark, you know, or the labor, I'm sure they'll just run and try to chop it up and eat it, which is wrong. But what that means is that we are still at an evolving stage in our life that means that we are surviving. Mm -hmm. Um, but as we survive, what that means is that startups have to start thinking of their solution being a mechanism for survival. You know, so food, communication, healthcare. Um, we might start to see some reduction in so much interest in maybe so much of entertainment. People start adjusting to, you know, life first. Um, and I think that because it's an unprecedented time, um, we would keep learning. Um, and yeah. the story for startups is just be open-minded. Um, just be open-minded. The guys that experienced the Spanish flu, most of them died, are dead now. So they, they are not around to share with us what they learned in 1918 or 1919. Uh, I'm sure during yeah. our own era, you know, um, in maybe in 100 years' time, um, what has happened now would have created a new normal. So it's that new normal that we need to embrace. And we have to embrace it with um, some form of um, warmth and love. You know? so, so thanks. Um, I think this is my little two Thank cents. You, <laughs> thanks. Beautiful. We're, we're keeping, the, we are keeping the, the best for the last. So once Ayo finishes with his own part of this deal, we'll go straight into the opportunities, which is the most important part of this. So I'm according to participants to drop their comments or their questions if they have any. Um, I hope to you, I'm still on the same adaptation strategies. Um, you did a yeah. series too, I'm not sure, maybe a webinar, and it was adopting an omnichannel retail sales strategy. So for my own layman understanding, I'm assuming you're trying to help people who buy and sell, or probably will have clients who, and they offer some services or solutions to 
to be able to still leverage yeah. on whatever opportunities they have this period to adapt. So would you want to break that for participants? What does it mean right now in the midst of COVID-19 to have an omnichannel retail stress strategy so they can still make ends meet? Okay. So, I mean, what, what I mean by omnichannel is just, um, I mean, it's not big grammar. It's basically having more than one channel. And in that webinar, um, what we talked about was having one channel is a very risky approach to selling. So think of the guys that just had a store where their customers could walk in. Now, the government says everyone is on lockdown. You can't go to, if, you're, if your business is not in the category of essentials, you have to, you have to shut it down. So it's very risky to just have one channel. And so what we were saying is, how do you transition from having just one channel to an omni-channel approach? So an omni-channel approach just means you are able to sell offline, you're able to sell online, and even while you're online, there are still several channels. You can sell on social media, you can sell on your website, you can sell via your WordPress. Or you see the challenge that comes with selling via multiple sales channels is that you don't have to, from a bookkeeping or record keeping perspective, you need to be able to harmonize all of okay. these records. So that's what um, we sort of mean by omni-channel. Um, but just to some of the, the points the earlier panelists have talked about, I mean, definitely um, business owners need to adapt. I, li I like the phrase, um, was it? Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember the name now. Basically, adapting strategic agility, right? Um, it's... It's very key and before anything can happen, I think the change must come within. And it's very, I think it's very important to note that the business owners or whoever is at the ends of affairs of that business needs to have uh, a very a found, a founder's mindset. And what I mean by that is that you need to be able to move and change fast because like one of the earlier speakers said, you have to move, speed is of essence during this period. and I was on a webinar with Steve Blank. Steve Blank is one of those um, thought leaders in entrepreneurship. I say the founder is the only person that can change the course of a company without any, I'm not sure how you put it, but basically what it means is that a founder is a person that can actually take decisions without the need to take approval. And so what I'm saying is C-level execs, business owners and corporate need to adopt a founder's mindset at this point in time because definitely you have to change and speed is of essence. And I also like how GDA talked about how the banks are looking beyond their core business. But I just want to jokingly push, push it to him that, you see, the banks also learn from the startup because they picked some of the traits from the startup. So it's just a very, <laughs> yeah, it's just a very wise thing to do during this period. Uh, some yeah. of the ways I think um, yeah. the adaptation can occur, again, from within is, because before anything can happen again, you need your employees, right? Apart from the owner of the business, you need your employees. But your employees, of course, they are not at work. So what can you do to sort of keep them engaged, retain them? Um, you can sell capacity. So maybe your business is not at yeah. capacity. You can sell it to another business. You can, in terms of sure. trying to capture value, move across the value chain. And, and there's several, several things you, that can be done, but I'm not sure if I still have more time to talk. Um, not to, not to spend too much time on that, yeah. Okay, Th thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ayo. So um, just to you know, lay the foundation for why this is important, the most important part for me is to hear from all of you guys, what are the opportunities embedded post-COVID? And I came across a very funny statistics that half of the Fortune 500 companies actually were giving birth to during um, the during recession periods. The world is going through a global recession right now. And there's this like half, about 50% of the Fortune 500 companies actually came during recession. They even went, went uh, as far as mentioned that 50 tech unicorns, that's startups who are valued at over $1 billion. 50 of them, I'm um, having about, if you calculate their total worth is about $143 billion. They all kickstarted their enterprises or startups during recession. An example is an Airbnb. Airbnb started during the last 27, yeah. 2009 recession. Even the founders were in recession because they couldn't pay for their rents. So it was the recession that made them think, okay, 
if we can't be foreign, there should be other ways to, you know, ensure we live in people's houses without owning the houses. So if we have all of these statistics, yeah. you know, saying that the end sorry, of sorry life is not a virus, not a pandemic. Quiet, please. Oh, quiet, please. Yeah. Sorry to just cut you on, on Airbnb. So I was listening to um, Brian today on, on a recent um, podcast he did with um, LinkedIn's yeah. founder. And you see, it's interesting that these guys were in the first, the last recession you just talked about, and they're in this COVID-19. And within the last two weeks, the way Airbnb has responded is incredible. Now, within these mm -hmm. last two weeks, they've, ra they've wow. raised $1 billion. They've had to move. You know, Airbnb, for those who don't know what Airbnb is, it's, it's basically uh, it's a travel business, and they basically let you use your house. Like, it's kind of like an hotel business, but you know, with what's happening now, hotels are shut down. So anything travel, lodging, shut down. But now, within okay. the last two weeks, they've had to raise one billion dollars. They've had to support their hosts in relief packages, like because these hosts depend on the income from people that lodge, right? Yeah. And so it's just incredible what he has done within the last two weeks. He's raised one. Is it one million or one million? Oh I'm not sure now, but he's raised a lot of money just in the last two weeks. They've had to pivot, like moving. So instead of you coming to a physical location, they now have online experiences. I mean, how do you do online experience? But they are selling that. So I just thought to, to put that in where you're talking about Airbnb. Yeah. So interesting. So I'll start with Ayo. I mean, Google, what's coronating in this coronavirus? How can we, beyond the post COVID, you know, be able to leverage opportunities? Where are these opportunities? Miriam was talking about e commerce, e everything, e entertainment, e learning. But in real terms, what should we be looking at post COVID for people probably who are a level to start up their businesses to repivot? For others who are trying to scale up, how should they position themselves and be one of the, you know, the, the benefits, one of those who take advantage of the post COVID pandemic? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. And uh, I, I would say it's not 100% clear. Uh, we're all still trying to figure out what the future would look like. Um, on one hand, and I think on the hand where you have the majority, uh, everyone is saying our habits, our behavior, our lives would fundamentally change post COVID-19 yeah. um, because it's a once perhaps in a century phenomenon. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who think that um, we would only be more the same. Uh, and, and I find that actually interesting. Um, for instance, there's, the, there's a popular quote from um, Professor Galloway that talks about how things won't change as much as they would ac accelerate, right? So he thinks that while other crises reshape the future, COVID-19 is just gonna make the future happen faster, uh, which I, I think I, I sort of like um, lean more towards. So what would the future look like? Um, there, there are a lot of assumptions. Uh, one of the things we're doing at Google is to look at the data and the insights today um, and try to see how that um, projects going into the future. Um, for instance, we find that um, in the last few weeks, uh, there's been sort of a major return um, to the very first level of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So people all of a sudden are now prioritizing their, their safety, um, their, their security, their food, um, ETC, right? So um, there's sort of like a shift from outward signaling um, to more um, self-expression, um, you know, most um, internal reflection, ETC. Um, and we think that trend will, will sort of like move on um, going forward. Also, we find that there's a, there's a trend around alone together, right? So I'm alone, but I'm also connected to other people. Um, and you can see the, the spike mm -hmm. in the usage of platforms like um, video conferencing, um, even social platforms like, um, I think it's called House Party, where people can connect going forward. So uh, we think um, those things would continue. Also very clearly, um, trends like od online ordering is also gonna be big, but it's not just gonna be restricted to um, you know, retail and food, but we're gonna see that in other verticals, okay. right? like healthcare especially. Um, there's, there's, the big, there's a concentration around contactless delivery and low touch delivery, right? So now companies are thinking about how we can provide our, especially our physical products to you with very limited um, um, physical touch. Um, and uh, if you look at places like China, uh, there's a lot of um, 
um, operations already going on in that side. I think even Domino's in Nigeria is doing something around that, that line. Um, I know Domino's in the, in, you know, okay. outside of Africa are already testing um, you know, delivery with um, autonomous um, vehicles and, and those kind of things. Um, I don't think this is going to be the era of drones where you'd have drones delivering everything, um, but certainly it has brought it much closer to us. Uh, and you know, we'll probably see that happen much faster than, than we thought we would. So um, I think in Phoenix in the US, um, the, there's a Google service that delivers, um, I think it's called Wings, um, that delivers uh, packages uh, and that has seen a significant uptick in the last few weeks. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, other areas that I think we would see a big um, spike going forward is in the area of remote work. Um, so, you know, companies okay. are significantly cutting down on their expenses. A lot of it has to do with manpower. Uh, we know usually during crises, um, you'd have winners and you'd have losers. And the winners are usually okay. the ones that you know, don't just make it past the crisis, but survive afterwards. Uh, so right now you have a lot of demands from overseas companies <clears throat> looking for uh, more cost-effective remote workers in the areas of software engineering, designers, product managers, analysts, writers, project managers, content marketers, digital marketers, etc. Right. So it's not just on an individual basis, but also looking at companies who offer those remote expert, um, expertise uh, to oversee company. And I think that will also continue going forward. Um, what other changes are we going to see? Um, remote everything is going to be big, right? So, you know, remote education, mm. remote entertainment, remote gyms, uh, remote counseling, um, all of those things are, I think are going to be big. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, interestingly, and I think it was Babajide that said this, I think we're also going to see um, a plateau in people's digital consumption. So you now find that more people are now trying to step back from digital platforms and digital services um, to connect more with, you know, their physical environment, people that they can see, um, you know, and so, you know, moderating your online exposure um, and your online um, consumption is also going to be a thing. And you literally see services that help you reduce how much time you spend online, um, what kind of information you're exposed to, your online security, etc. Um, you know, so there, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, viewpoints around what the future might look like. I like to think that the best way to predict the future is to sit really closely with your consumers today, right? So feel the pulse of your users or your target users and try to understand how they are thinking, you know, what are their fears? What are the things they are worried about? How are they thinking about the future? We know there's going to be a recession coming up. Um, and usually in recessions, you'd have people spend less and save more, right? That could give us an insight yeah. into, you know, how we want to position our services or even what kind of services and product to offer to these people. So um, if your product helps me save money, be more efficient with my spending, um, reduce my cost, mm -hmm. ETC, I'll be very interested in that, right? So already we, we know that there is already a sort of like a down, downturn in searches for luxury and fashion um, and those kind of things because people are prioritizing the more urgent, uh, more important things um, for them. So, you know, cost savings, efficiency, discounts, free trial, those kind of things are really going to be important. And even as a marketing strategy, um, you can look at how you can implement those things. So if there were ever a time to offer a freemium product, uh, it's probably during this season. Um, just uh, maybe a random data. Um, in February uh, in Nigeria, there was about 16 million um, monthly active users on YouTube. As at this month, we have about 25 million monthly active users on YouTube. So you have, you've, we've seen almost 10 million new uh, monthly users come on YouTube just in Nigeria alone, right? Which means there's going to be a lot of consumption for digital entertainment. Um, people are going to be searching more uh, for stuff on YouTube, things to learn, education, fashion, lifestyle, um, other kind of content. So if you're in the content creation space, now is a good time to get into video. Um, something funny, a few days ago, I, I saw a, a Nigerian band actually have a live stream and they put up their account number right there on the screen. I know how um, in the <laughs> physical world, 
you pay, you give them some cash and they'll sing your name. And these guys were replicating exactly. this thing online yeah. and they had it going for hours, right? Oh my and my when my you did a transfer to the number on the screen, my they sang your name for like five minutes and then they moved on to the next table. So we're going, oh to, see, we're going to see the <laughs> wow, most traditional industries actually go online and people are going to be very creative. In fact, I think this isolation is a, is a good opportunity for most people to introspect and think about the creative ways to bring uh, more traditional offerings to the digital space. Um, and uh, also, I think we are seeing the largest scale of digital experimentation ever in the world, right? And it's going to continue and people will find what works and what doesn't work. So there's a lot to think about. I think the biggest signal, only because we can predict and project from now till tomorrow, but the biggest signal is to sit yeah. with your consumers, with your users, feel their calls, do video calls with them. Now is the best time for that. Um, send out surveys, have a chat with them, understand where their head is at, what their more um, pressing needs are and what their long-term needs would be, and then try to adapt your product, your services to those things. Beautiful, beautiful. Sit with your consumers, your customers, your clients, and feel their pulse. So we talk about where should we be looking at post-COVID-19? So we talk about, yeah. You're, you're mute. Okay, it has been very exciting uh, listening to what everybody has to say uh, regarding this. But uh, I was taking a step back, you know, to think about, uh, you know, where ev what everybody's saying actually comes together. It, it comes together, uh, I, a lot of governments, you know, uh, international organizations, and, you know, private citizens themselves, they are going to actually be coming out post COVID-19 to try to offer help to businesses that failed, businesses that struggled, you know, and even businesses that were battered as a result of COVID-19. So if you are a business out there, you really have to think ahead of time so that when these opportunities come, you are not the only ones that are going to try to assess them. So you actually have to be prepared. You have to think ahead of time. The government of Nigeria, for example, they actually will respond one way or the other. It could be a series of new loans, you know, to businesses in one way or the other. Most of the funds that private citizens are donating, corporate organizations are donating, this money, you know, it's not everything that's going to go into COVID-19. Of course, we know yeah. we have a peculiar situation in Nigeria and all that. Now, uh, at Afrolabs, we've created a platform. Um, the platform is covidtech.africa. COVIDtech.africa. Now, if you go to the platform, you are going to see a lot of the responses that's ongoing regarding COVID-19. You know, opportunities right now on COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. You know, the things you can actually start taking advantage of right now and the things you can take advantage of after this. You know, that's so I would encourage you, if you are listening to this and you start up, you are a small business, you know, to actually go to that platform and actually return frequently to that platform. So that's yes. beautiful. Th thank you so much for that. I just read also that Jack Ma Foundation also just released some funds for African business heroes. That's the name of the fund, trying to look for young people who probably have you know disruptive ideas. So what I mean, it's just funny how so much money seems to be flying about right now, and some of them are tilted towards health, the health sector. Somebody had to ask me within my team that are we going to should we try and create an yeah. app? So, you know, yeah. within the health sector, so, I mean, is that way it works? Like, just because so much money is available, let's all go into health and create something. Yeah, but it's let, interesting. Let, let, let interesting me add, uh, yeah, let me even add something. That uh, we, on Monday, we're actually releasing a new challenge, you know, to the uh, okay. education innovators on the continent, you know, asking them that okay. what's, yeah, to actually propose solutions to current COVID-19 challenges. But actually, our hope is that whatever solutions are actually, they're actually going to propose, you can actually uptake them post-COVID-19. And, and we're going to be offering Beautiful. them you know, funding, yeah, funding, you know, connection with partners. The World Bank, the Feed, you know, the Bill Gates Foundation, they're on board, this and all that. So it's really, really huge. As, as an innovator, you really have to start thinking, start Googling. Of course, even if your business is affected or shut down in one way, or the order, please Beautiful. don't wait until you know anybody has to tell you. You need to start right now, following Beautiful. what's happening. Yeah, thank you so much. COVID 
tech.africa for those who didn't pick that please go and apply for your phone so that Labs can give you like one million dollars post-covid <laughs> miriam what should we be looking at post-covid opportunities yes um really really uh great great points shared so far i have highlighted a few things very practical uh things here and i saw a question here as well about the airline airline and and shipping goods and and this touches a little bit on your uh, your internal company discussion about whether you should go into healthcare. So, um, one of the first thing that I will will mention. Well, there are three ways that the startups can respond uh, respond here. There's, you know, they can be have better strategic sensitivity, um, leadership unity, and and resource fluidity. And if you're a small company, if you're a startup, you have you should have this in spades. You're not a big operation that you cannot um, um, be close to your customer. And if you haven't been close to your customer before, now's the time <laughs> to be close to your customer and even open it a little bit more broadly. And um, in terms of now, other than this, having this capability or this meta capabilities, what you then need to do, I think some startup will need to uh, collaborate more. I think that we need to we need to start seeing people join forces. Some startups need to merge so that they can combine forces uh, to capture value a little bit better, or they need to join with adjacent industry. Someone talked about the uh, going up or down the supply chain. So say this person who is saying that, you know, they use the airline industry to ship food, right? Uh, uh, big airline players right now, they're, their costs are too much. They're, they're essentially bleeding and losing money. Uh, but what if uh, some some uh, startups can join forces or join with, uh, I don't know, an aviation school, someone who has some uh, understanding of the airline industry, and they can start small charter planes to move just goods. Now, while most countries have shut down, most of them, they're not shutting down uh, goods from going in and out. People aren't traveling, but goods are in most countries moving in and out. So what is that something that you can do? You can collaborate with a, 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 a where they have this understanding of the airline industry, how to move from, you can start from across Africa. Let's, you know, we will deliver twice a week for everybody who is buying goods from this part of Africa so that you will have your own materials. Uh, that is an example of that kind of collaboration. Uh, they're both strengthening in that way and they're able to capture uh, opportunities. Uh, if you're talking about healthcare um, services, for instance, there are people who are providing uh, healthcare that you, for example, someone who is um, uh, in this time providing like uh, medicine to, to people during coronavirus or, or whatever, then they can be someone who is like a food service, you know, uh, a company where they can combine forces together you know, how can we like help people? One of the biggest issue in, in COVID-19 is people with underlying health conditions are suffering disproportionately. So what is it? And we know that nutrition is, of course, very important. Mental health is, is a part of like, you know, all, all manners of underlying illnesses and so forth. So what if you could combine with a pharma uh, a company, you know, and produce, provide holistic care, uh, you know, tailored um, uh, food, um, uh, like weekly shopping list of food resources. And then you can collaborate with a supermarket who is now closed or, or local supermarkets who are now closed and do the delivery. So, so if we look back during the, at the Silicon Valley story, we hear of the um, PayPal mafia. They didn't combine forces because they liked each other. In fact, their infamous story about you know, how much they battled and how they never got along and there were factions and so forth. But they recognized the strategic importance, you know, of combining forces. So yeah. I think this is something that the startups need to start looking into. It doesn't mean if you know, uh, for in, in some cases, and personally, I'm a firm believer that you should only, people should focus on what they're good at. I think yeah. it's good for the ecosystem. If you're a great teacher, be a great teacher and combine with someone who can provide digital tools for you to deliver your teaching. I'm a very firm believer in that. So it doesn't mean that you need to now create new business necessarily. You may need to combine forces. And then secondly, not only combining forces with startups, combine forces with established 
um, companies as well. I think this is an opportunity both from the startup's point of view and from the large organization as well to gain some strategic um, uh, capabilities here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the startups can work with those who are already established. You know, they, they have, if you are going to go into manufacturing um, or uh, like value adding to food, you know, a, a fun thing. I went to Zambia, we had a business thing there and we had like two days of seminars on goat value chain. <laughs> And it was like the most fun thing ever. I mean, like, yes, we all love goat meat. That's good. And that's fine. But there's a whole industry, you know, yeah, around yeah. Um, value adding to the goat <laughs> Interesting. value chain. So, you know, what if there's something that you can begin to, to offer? Like you want to now start, let's say, you know, packaging the goat meat at, as beef jerky. You could work with an established, you know, organization who already have the capacity, the manufacturing, and now you bring a new type of product portfolio uh, to them. At the same time, you keep a sustainable, sustainable business. So you're both sharing resources. So, uh, and then also uh, founders are great and founders are important, but it's also important that um, they, when we talk about strategic sensitivity is that they have, they can be aware that good ideas can come from anywhere, yeah. you know, and they have to be open-minded to exploring our, uh, the, the broader stakeholder group around them to source for this idea, you know, yeah. and they have to keep uh, in, in challenges, people, it's, it's a shame that in, in challenging situation is when we need to collaborate more, but people often pull into themselves and founders also very much pull into themselves because you know you don't have money to pay your staff. You don't really understand the future of founders. Can often be used to being the one who know, you know, where we're going and what we're doing. But now is a time when we don't really know, and they can have a tendency to be um, a bit sensitive because of that and overcompensate, you know, by, by yeah. being a bit more forceful and demanding, and you know. But people are key. So now is the time that founders need to be open. And, and be willing to share with their customer and all the stakeholders around them that, listen, you know what, let's rethink this thing. Uh, what direction do we need to go? What, what ideas? Yeah. You know, an example is Nokia. You all know Nokia, of course. Uh, being Nokia was founded is, is a Finnish um, organization and all of that. And some of you might not know that, you know, Nokia used to sell toilet paper. Yeah. That was one of their <laughs> founding core uh, businesses. And then, they were selling tires and the idea came from you know a totally not really from the executive leadership that you know what like this toilet paper business maybe we need to diversify to telecommunications you know and they're drastically different so uh drastically different ideas uh, come from unimagined sources so they need to be a little bit more open uh, uh to exploring that and finally of course um new business model when you are collaborating with people um you need to be open enough to know that you are no longer it's no longer your way or the highway and it's no longer yeah. your interest alone so uh work with the stakeholder that you you are engaging with to rethink what are new b business model where you both can win you know this is not a zero sum game um at this point that's not the point that you will squeeze out every amount of money that you can from them, from your partners and your collaborators and even your customers. So now is the time to think a little bit that how do you uh, reshape your business model in a way that you both thrive, right? Uh, so that they can continue surviving because your existence can very often depend on their uh, longer term success as well. So in, in summary of this very winded, <laughs> um, um, analysis is you need more collaboration now think outside the box yeah. you don't need to create all the capabilities yourself you can acquire by engaging with others if there's a there are sexy yeah. uh, industries uh, right now for example I can send I actually have a, a very nice document about uh, from uh, researchers about what are the hot stuff uh, right now I'm broken down into sub sub segment I think some people might find this 
interesting. So, uh, uh, you know, acquire the capability through partnership, uh, through joining your forces and restarting your startup and, um, you know, rethink your business model and, you know, be, uh, it's not a zero sum game. Thank you very much. I can see um, one of the participants, Star, he raised that hand. So, Star will give you like a few seconds to ask your question. But just before that, I would like Tayo also to just also let us know where to find the rainbow in this gloomy sky post COVID. What should we be looking at as small businesses and startups? Okay, um, thank you once again. So very quickly, um, before I go into some of, go into some of the things I've written down, I would also um, just read what I wrote down before we started this. So here I say, beyond COVID-19, um, startups need a full reassessment of your business and of your model. So you need a full reassessment. You need to look at it, you know, from the beginning to the start, um, from the start to end. Then second here is um, some businesses may actually require full pivot, you know, full pivot, you know, total direction of what you're doing. Um, but then in the least, Everyone needs a realignment with people's immediate and long-term needs, you know, immediate and long-term needs. Now, um, you know, for me, um, as a person, um, I am not very comfortable with boxing people into certain industries uh, because that seems like the hot stuff now. Because what, then that, what that does is that you then have like sort of like a bandwagon effect where everybody that's going in that direction. I know that we already have that problem here in some sort of water companies starts and everybody just starts producing pure water. Like, ah, ah, what's happening? You know, so one person starts yeah. this. So what I'll rather uh, propose um, is that people should open up to what Okay, seems we lost time. Sayo? Okay, um, she's not online for now. I think connection problems. Um, Ayo, do you want to jump in while we wait for Tai to come back? Ayo, yes. That's Ayo Daudu. I know that Tayo's on the call. Ayo Daudu, yes, please. All right, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of growth opportunities, right, um, there are a couple of things. Um, but let me start from the, from the visual aspect. Since we are all moving online, we now need to be more security conscious. Like there's going to be increase in cyber attacks. Uh, so as you are moving online, you need to also pay a little attention, not a little actually, you need to pay some attention to security uh, because we need to, I mean, if you, if you come from the physical world, you know, we, if you have a store, you then need to have padlocks, you have good security doors. Think of the same concept for your virtual environment. You need to have good security. I was on a webinar, was it three or four days ago? And I was on Zoom, this same Zoom that we're using, but for some reason, I just forgot to gate the old, like put a password on it. The call was like jacked in the middle of the call. And we just had wow. like random people come in, drawing on the screen and like speaker was speaking and we just had to stop. It was really bad that, I just had to tell them to leave the call and then let me put a password on it. So wow. we just need to pay attention to security. This same Zoom app, it can be just, just so you know, and it goes with every other platform, right? We need to pay attention sure. to security. Um, another thing is there's opportunity for hyper efficiency. And what I mean by this is because the online world is so connected, um, interesting things will begin to happen. So you, you, you buy something from your store and because you bought that product you can start getting cross-selling um sales pitches online like so it's it's going to be very interesting and there's there's going to be new should i say new segment of value that will be unlocked um okay. in that area um someone talked miriam talked about collaboration yes i think everyone needs to now like own their stuff but be also be able to be humble enough to collaborate and join forces with 
um, people in the space and basically to win the market. It's not, we are not now competing against each other. You are not collaborating because the, what you need to win is the market. So if, oh, yeah. if startup founders um, can see it in that light, then greater value can be unlocked. The next thing I would like to talk about is selling your capacity. I think I touched on it a bit. So as a, as a business owner, you would have employees, but of course, you're not going to have enough to pay them because of the whole situation. And you, rather than you laying them off, um, aside the additional measures you have put in place, like maybe salary cuts and things like that, there's an opportunity in selling that capacity. So for an event business, like um, I was on a on webinar call with Funke Zafaya, and she, she complained about not having like not being able to engage her staff like she was just thinking aloud on how she was going to keep them engaged retain the staff that she spent so much to train and all of that okay. and put forward that you can actually sell these capacities to someone else um so you lend your staff to another business that is in, is, in, is booming to say and you can get paid for that finally uh, moving across the value chain for a food business uh maybe you typically would sell finished produce. So say for a bakery, right? You sell baked bread, you sell um, donuts, you sell things that are finished. But now we all know that um, there's a limitation. If, if you're operating a physical store, you're no longer getting work from customers. You can sell the frozen dough just before you pop it into the oven. You can actually package the frozen dough, uh, make a recipe kit and there's a whole new segment of do-it-yourself uh, economy whereby we are selling pre-made um, food packages to people and then people can buy it and then they complete the process of food. Um, so you remain in business. Um, same thing applies to any other, any other sector. If it's for fashion, you're not going to sell it ready-made, but maybe you can sell the kits you need to make a particular piece or something. So just moving across the value chain, whether it's up or down, um, you can explore the opportunities right there. Um, that's it for me in terms of good opportunities. Beautiful. Thanks. F -f thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ayodawadu. Um, Ty is back. Um, the last point I noted from what you said before you got offline was in, um, focus, realignment to people's immediate and long-term needs. You gave us some points. So if you would like to wrap up that before we get into yeah, the question that we have and then we'll round off. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the break in transmission. Um, so yes, I was saying that um, rather than boxing uh, people into certain industries, you know, to say, oh, this is the hot cake right now, or these are the hot spots right now, that um, we need to actually, businesses, startups need to actually open up to what is possible as it aligns with their um, capabilities, you know, and so sort of like disrupting yourself in, in some sort, you know, looking at what you do, how do you disrupt that, you know, because when you look at it really, um, some of these business, businesses that were, re they were making reference to or references to, you know, um, they, they, they didn't, it wasn't just like, oh, this is what people are doing and let's just go there, you know, so they came, those things came out of, of course, what's happening right now, terrible things are happening, you know, there are going yeah. to be a lot of changes. Uh, people are challenging some sort, but then thinking deep into those needs and then seeing how our capabilities as a startup or as an organization fits into those needs, you know. So, um, of course, there'll be some factors to help you do this um, and very quickly um, to be able to, um, you know, create your own impact. Um, so technology will be a key factor in this age, you know. Startups need to um, up their game. We might think, or we might say, well, of course, startups are already within the technology space and all of that. But then still, it's also about them, not just about you, but about your users. So there's you, then there are your users, there are your customers. How do you help them um, at this time to also leverage technology, you know, mm. for their businesses? Then yeah. another factor here would be cost. You know, yeah. cost will be a very key factor, which we have to look at that, um, Anything that will help people or businesses bring their costs down right now, they will jump on it. So what can you do right now in, within your business model that can help you to bring costs down and that can also help your customers to bring us down? 
be it from the point of your product or from the point, point of your processes, from delivery, from packaging, anything that will help people to actually bring their costs down right now is something we have to be looking at. And then um, another point I noted here is that there will be a rise of more poor people. It's, it's certain there will be a rise of more poor people. How do mm. you plug into that? The fact mm. that there will be a rise of more poor people. So about, will it be about you know, delivering um, services that otherwise could not reach them, but in a way that is more accessible and affordable mm. you know, for poor people? Because they will still need these things, but, be, yeah. they will get, you know, but then they won't be able to afford it and it might not be accessible. So how do you break it down? So maybe working like um, the last, I didn't hear much of what um, um, IOS, IO um, spoke about, but I, I was in on Miriam's um, last point, you know, around opportunities, you know, talking about collaboration. So yeah. in this form, we'll be looking at how do you collaborate, collaborate with big organizations, maybe to cascade their products or services down to what becomes more accessible and affordable for um, for, for the people, you know, be, uh, um, at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, how do you do that? How do you yeah. bring those, those to people, you know? Um, then w one thing I want to say here, um, you know, um, I know we've been talking about survival, survival and all of that, but maybe it's my, it's also, it's a mentality that I have as a sustainable development professional that um, while survival is good, but there is a need, especially on a continent like Africa and in a place like Nigeria, for people to rise above the survival mentality yeah. if there's going to be sustainability. Because mm. that's the same reason why you have a lot of business that just start and then we don't have sustainable businesses. We don't have too many businesses mm. that go do well for myself and then move on. No, it's beyond that. It's about yeah. the fact that this presents to us an opportunity to do something different on this continent. Mm. You know, that's why when I said I was talking she, about that she was talking about sustainability um, we need to do I think... something different. Do you still have me? Yeah, she's still on. Yeah, please go on. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah, still on. So I was talking, so I said that we, we need to, yes, yeah, so, so on a continent, and which is some of the sessions that we take our fellows, that we need to start thinking beyond our survival, you know, just my survival or, or the survival. We can't grow businesses that way. And we have a serious challenge on our hands. As a continent, we have a challenge. You know, I watched the video of China um, saying, oh, uh, so they are chasing uh, Africans, doing all of that, chasing Nigerians. And I'm like, what, what, what can we get out of all of this? You know, people here are there chasing us, we are here are chasing us, and just doing, you know. So I don't know. We just need to begin to think differently about us, about our continent, about our people, about, especially about the young people. Because we have so many opportunities. We have a lot of opportunities right now. A lot of continents. Europe is. Someone, one of their prime ministers said recently that Europe is actually a old and haggard uh, continent. Everyone is old. The people are getting old. And, you know, this Africa is the youngest continent right now. So we have able-bodied men and women who have the capacity to work and to do stuff. You know, so we need to start tapping into those opportunities, even this post-COVID. And this presents us an opportunity for reflection. How do we tap into those Capacity building, you know, I, in, my, in my article, I spoke about the fact that you have the, um, you know, you talk about the prosperity formula, where you talk about capacity building, you talk about financial um, innovation, um, and then um, I forgot the last one, the social, you know, when you talk about facilities and all of that. We need to start as young people who are, you know, either running startups or doing one thing or the other, being in this innovation space, we need to start tapping more into what we have as a continent. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'll, I'll just like Baba to just touch a bit on opportunities too, and then I will give somebody in the uh, part of the participants to ask a question, and then the panelists will have a last word, and then we can wrap up for tonight. So just briefly, what do you have to say, Baba Yeah, yeah. So, so I think um, basically everyone has, um, in some way or the other, um, highlighted um, core opportunities, um, but the opportunity really um we would keep unfolding um because we've never lived in these times before 
um, we can only postulate and assume um, based on um, the realities we found ourselves. Um, but I would just like to reemphasize some core areas um, that has been highlighted by some of our panelists to say um, collaborations will be very, very important. Um, and that's part of what um, corporate institutions that I, I represent, for example, has been trying to drive. Um, how can an institution like mine, uh, you know, partner with um, startups uh, because we believe that they are agile and they are quick to market. Um, so they might not have um, the financial buoyancy or capacity because they've not been in business for 30 or 40 years. Um, we might have acquired that over the years. So how can we collaborate um, across the different sectors? Um, areas of opportunities would consistently be um, in the areas of digital skills. Um, there will be consistent need for software engineers. Um, and um, this need has always been there, but I think this need has come to stay and would be reemphasized because businesses more and more would need to digitize. So businesses that have run an entirely manual process will need to digitize. And what that means is that they would need guys with the requisite skills. You know, I'll give you a good example um, from a banking point of view. Um, we have several um, processes till date that are paper-based. Um, and we are grappling with how to digitize it, okay. um, especially in the wholesale space, corporate space. Um, it's fairly easy at the retail space. Um, so for example, internet banking for individuals, digitizing it is easy because you have some simple base of authentication. But when you okay. talk about corporates that have different levels of authorization and the host of yeah. other systems, and these people's True. internal processes are still paper-based. What would happen is that um, they themselves will see that they need to digitize their process. And in digitizing their process, it would also make it easy for us as uh, a financial institution and every other institution, you know, to work with them, you know. So um, the onslaught of digitization is, is finally here. Yeah? Um, is closer, um, and um, the required skill um, to become digital citizens um, would, would, would pick up. So um, we've been talking about a bit around e-learning. Um, so I think there will be a lot of retooling on digital marketing, um, okay. people trying to understand analytics, um, data analytics, understanding data, because the data will leave the paper and will go to the digital space. Um, there will yeah. also be a spike in having more cybersecurity specialists. Um, I like the fact that IODAUDU raised, um, because part of the areas that manually we've invested so much funds is in security. So when people move fully to the digital space, you would see that there will be that requirement to secure ourselves further digitally. You know, so so I see um, a silver lining in that, um, and I think um, psychologically we just need to remain hopeful, positive, um, and as dynamic as we can be. Um, and I like the point Emita you also raised around sustainability, um, that um, as we look at our businesses as core survival, um, the only way it can last for 30, 40, 50 years is if um, we are adding value in a sustainable way. Um, I, and I think um, uh, let's keep being positive um, and we'll come okay. out of this very successful. And there will be Thank the you. birth of new billionaires. I can I I I know processes like this give birth to new billionaires. 
Um, I hope Amen. I'll be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was the only one tempted to shout Amen, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, so, you know, because it, it's just <laughs> historical, you know, it's historical. Um, you know, um, yeah, yeah, it's historical. Um, after the First World War, right. Second World War, you know, there are always, once, once we have monumental changes like this, um, something new just busts out. Um, and and um, I, hope, I hope some of our attendees and even part of us as panelists um, experience that Eureka moment where we can tap into becoming yeah, the yeah, billionaires yeah. of this, this season. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks so much, Roger <laughs> yeah. Day. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Tayo would like to say something. That, yeah. Yes, I just want to quickly say something just in the line of what um, um, Babaji Day just said now. So I have something that just popped up on my phone right now that Netflix, Netflix stock hit record high is now worth more than Disney. Netflix wow. is now worth more than Disney. Wow. Um, the, the next uh, information, Netflix now worth more than ExxonMobil as value reaches <laughs> One ninety six billion dollars. Can you imagine that? Interesting. Can, Interesting. can you imagine that? So that just yeah. that just goes to talk about what we're talking about in terms of how yeah. how amazing things burst from you know such uh, challenges. You know, mm. you know. So I just want to drop yeah. that. So let, let's continue. Thank you. No, I mean, beautiful, beautiful discussions and rich ones. It just made me also remember the story of Japan too. I mean, how from the Hiroshima, you know, nuclear bomb blast, the country came back and, I mean, flooded the entire space with Mitsubishi, Suzuki, all of them, and they became a G7, what, I mean, a part of the, you know, global power from, you know, a war-torn country and back to be a global power economically and politically. So, I mean, thanks, Babajide, for that. I'm going to allow Star to, she raised her hand to, you know, to make a comment, and then I would read some of these questions that we have typed i probably just pick on each panelist to answer each of the questions and then we'll wrap up. So start, please, if in, probably in 30 seconds, if you could just make your comments. So I have allowed you to. So you should unmute right now and, you know, go ahead and. All right. Good evening, all. Um, good evening. Yeah. I, I good evening. evening. All right. Um, a quick question. Um, Something like this has happened about a hundred years ago, um, I think 1918 to 1919. Um, it was a pandemic as well. So uh, I think one of the major carriers of the pandemic to various countries in the world were true ships then, because I think the airlines were not on then. So it was after the pandemic of 1918 to 1919 that came about um, the innovation of airlines. Um, so true, um, the pandemic was spread across the world through ships. Uh, and what I'm trying to ask is, um, then the major innovation that came to play after that pandemic was the airline innovation and a, a type of, like a means of transportation, a new means of transportation after that, which is the airline. Um, and now something like this is happening again, you know, after a hundred years and the major way to transmit or the major carrier of this disease to the various countries of the world is the airline now that was innovated then, you know, after the pandemic of 1918 to 1919. So my question now is, what do we think is going to be the new innovation that is going to come out of this, you know, and how is it going to affect the tech world? Okay, all right. So thank you, Star. Um, any panelists can jump on that and answer. Um, yeah, um, I think I want to answer that. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, sure. Yeah, I was actually um, I was reading an article regarding uh, responses to. Uh, the Spanish flu in 1918, uh, how the economy, how innovators, you know, how governments across the world, how they responded to that, and the opportunities that came from that 
particular pandemic had to do with remedies. You know, remedies regarding uh, what the disease is, what the solution to the disease is, and okay. what people felt, what people saw, what people experienced during the disease, and what people were planning to experience outside the disease. Okay, so uh, as a person, you should be asking yourself after this is all over, okay, what are the solutions that are going to be needed to prevent this from happening all over again, okay? Um, you are going to see innovations in the healthcare system, okay, beyond what you've seen before. It could be in re reporting, you know, in data the analysis. There's a lot of blame throwing from every country right now regarding uh, was China, when we too late in China reporting this, uh, was my country too late in getting to this, you are going to see a new way to actually discover, yeah. you know, and to actually respond to this kind of pandemics, okay? Now, people have been locked in their houses for how many weeks? Some for months now in other countries. You are going to see what are these people going to want to do after this in the short term. Innovations mm -hmm. that address this are going to really, really okay. blow up. They're going to, let me just use what Nigerians love. They are going to make a lot of money. <laughs> because Nigerians love their language, yeah. right? Okay, so innovations that address that in short term, and then there's going to be the medium term. They are in transportation, just focus on the remedies. Okay, the longer term yeah. is still, you know, some years are high and all that. But in the short term yeah. and the medium term, okay, the remedies to COVID-19, mm, Please focus on them, research the remedies. Remedies, this is not just about healthcare alone, you know, okay? Okay. Well, how people, even mental, okay? How people are going to think after this, yeah. you know, the psychological yeah. effect of this and all that. What they are going to want to do to escape this. It could be maybe they want to get drunk, you know? <laughs> they might want to get drunk, you never know. So how would they want to get yeah. drunk? So just think, you know? Around that, and you could actually thank you. do something. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I hope so. I hope you you got it. So I'm going to read. I have like five questions, and I'm going to just share them. You know, as led. You know, just speak. Um. So I have one question here, and this is the question from Olanike Akinremisi. He says, "I have a content creation company that I started recently. How do I infuse today's discussion into my business?" In order to survive COVID nineteen and beyond, um, Ayode, Ayode, would you want to give that a shot? Content um, creation think, company. Yeah, I think the lowest hanging fruit uh, for a content creation company. Um, obviously, there's a lot more users online than usual, so there's a big opportunity for you to sort of like find a way to study trends and um, interest and, and find out what people are most interested in. Um, Google has a tool called um, um, Google Trends. Um, go to trends.google.com. Um, can help you see what's most searched and most um, you know researched on Google Search and on YouTube. Those things can give you indicators into what people are interested in, and you guys can um, create content or modify existing content to take advantage of, of the interest. Um, also, obviously, a lot of interest on YouTube now. Um, you know, just as much as there is on Netflix and it's a free platform that this is the perfect opportunity to get into video if you guys don't already have video content. Uh, so get in there, take advantage of it, start building your audiences and in the long term monetize. Um, so I think as a content company, you guys should be very busy during this period. Um, look at what people go to Twitter and, and look at Twitter trends and look at what people are talking about. Um, there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation during this period, right? Um, step into that mm -hmm. space and, you know, provide really authentic, correct um, information um, where there are fake news, you know, address it. Often there's a lot of, uh, you know, reports from WHO, from NCDC, a lot of things that people don't understand. You guys can step into that space yeah. and help people understand, okay, uh, Buari had, uh, you know, a press conference last night. What does it mean? What does it mean for you? You know, what does it mean for you as a, as a fashion business or as a small business owner or as an education person, etc. Yeah. Right? Um, create those things. Uh, people are very interested in learning. Um, look for you know short, yeah. snackable, easy to digest content. Explore different formats, not just text. 
um, but images, videos, GIFs, all sort of format. This is a time to be creative. Uh, you have a lot of young folks from school who are back on holiday. Hire them in remote jobs, pay them 10K, 20K, whatever. Get them to start writing for you, right? Just churn out as much content as possible um, during this period because you have more than the usual share of people um, who come online, online during this period on, on social media, on video, on blogs, etc. So just get out there and create as yeah. much as possible. That, that was hard, Ayo. Thank you very much. So this second question goes to um, Ayo Dawudu. It says, my question goes to Ayo as regards the codes of startups being lean on like the, okay, I think actually it's to Ayo did too. But if, if Ayo will jump on this, Ayo Dawudu, if you want to jump. Um, if I'm correct, that okay. implies the less human capital and then how do we compensate for that as unemployment spikes? In what ways can that be balanced up? Okay. Do you have, can you read the question from Temisa or should care? Yeah, I'll just run through it. So I think what she's trying to find out is, uh, my question goes to Aya as regards to the quote of being, being on like, if I'm correct, that implies less human capital. Well, there's always a common uh, misinterpretation of what it means to be lean. Um, so the whole concept of the lean startup came from a man called Eric Reyes and also Steve Blank. Um, aside from it being that you can do much more with less, it's also um, the, lean, the lean methodology also embodies a culture of learning fast. Um, so there's, there's a concept of going through the learn measure. There's a cycle you have to go through as fast as you can. So you learn, uh, you build something, you measure and you learn. And so that's, that's the core of lean, but also you can do much more with less. Um, so we have a concept of minimum viable product, which means that if you want to start something, if you want to launch a new business, what is the least amount of resources you can put together to sort of validate your assumptions um, to prove that that business can survive, right? So I guess that's what you're trying to find out um, in terms of in comparison with brick and mortar. Then the other part of your question says, um, how do you for that as unemployment spikes? Yes, um, I mean, Unemployment, yeah. So a lot of people might get laid off and then those that have jobs might be might not be running at full capacity. So what that means is basically an opportunity for people to do much more. And like I was saying recently, this is the period to try out things, right? You want to, you don't want to wait till the whole lockdown is over. This is the time to put out something, get feedback, learn from it. And that's actually the information you gather during this period is what we inform the decisions post COVID. Um, so it's all about experimentation this period, really. Um, Amazon has a culture of experimentation and their service is largely injured on the number of experiments they can run per minute per time. So what we want to be doing now is trying out things, learning fast, getting feedback, because these are the information or data points that would sort of inform our decisions once we get out of the lockdown. I hope I was able to answer those questions. Thank, thank you, Ayo. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask Miriam to speak on the next question from Gilles that has to do with um, future of grocery delivery on the, on the continent as a whole and globally. If Miriam can jump on that. Yeah. Um, this, is a, this is a very interesting question. Um, so, do you think consumer behaviors will come back to normal as before the crisis, as the economy starts to pick up a great momentum or consumer behaviors will extend over the long term? Uh, so, uh, this, uh, with many like consumer behavior questions right now, I think there's not, there isn't, for, for certain things like this, uh, grocery delivery, for example, there's not going to be one global behavior because cultures are, again, very different. And the level of infrastructure that exists in different countries are very different. Um, um, I think some very important point that Temitayo men mentioned was that there's going to be more poor people. And this is the reality. And poor people are not going to be able to afford uh, grocery shopping online. So it's in some countries, let's say in, um, in Northern Europe, for example, we're going to see huge spikes. We're seeing already huge spikes in, in online delivery. But I think that that trend 
saying is a function of how long this situation, the lockdown lasts. Because yeah. uh, if, if the, for example, in, in Helsinki here, uh, we're locked down until the end of, um, end of May. And in fact, the whole city of Helsinki itself, the, what we call the Usima region, it contains about four, four other cities, Helsinki being the biggest, kind of the southern part of Finland was locked down from other parts of Finland, like, you've had, like, like in Lagos as well now. And now they've lifted and people are able to, to move a little bit. Uh, out, outside Lagos, and maybe the entire lockdown will not even last till May. It might end uh, closer uh, in the near future. Uh, and that means that this uh, online delivery, yes, some of it, some people will realize that it's a nice idea. They'll want to engage with it. But because of the short time that it has been implemented, uh, many companies have not been able to optimize it very well. So the supermarket have had to uh, uh, supermarket chains that we have here who also own restaurants, they've brought in their staff who can't be in the restaurant anymore because of the lockdown to uh, do food packaging. And taxi companies, for example, who don't, you know, their taxi business isn't uh, going forward anymore. They're now doing del delivery. But this is only short term. Things are going to yeah. return back to normal. And people go where the money is, right? So your taxi business makes infinitely more money for you than delivering groceries for a supermarket. And also doing your taxi business gives you more freedom than sort of being an errand boy or errand girl or woman for like a delivery, uh, delivery place. So, so again, some behaviors in certain countries will not change too much because uh, if this doesn't last too long, people just, you know, uh, cope with what is now and, and just uh, and go forward, um, uh, uh, leave their, their normal life as, as best as they can after that. And then you have a country like Germany. It's really interesting that they don't like, they're very untrusting of uh, uh, fintech, you know. Uh, Germany, I remember that, I don't know if you've had this experience uh, in Germany, you couldn't pay with credit card in most places. Yeah. <laughs> you have to pay with cash. Yeah. Um, in, in many true. places, you know, I mean, like they're things that, I mean, Africa is miles ahead of them when we come to like fintech in, in many ways. Yeah. So, you know, and you need uh, that kind of financial structure uh, to do online grocery sales and delivery and all of these things. Uh, so, so that may not, again, Germany, they've now lifted uh, their lockdown uh, while well, they're like slowly lifting it. So I don't for I don't foresee uh, seismic changes uh, in behavior and pattern on that on that yeah. note. But yes, yeah, certainly the market is booming now, and the convenience of it uh, will be very very good even when things return to normal. But the reality is that um, uh, that you're still going to run in places where they're culturally accepting of certain yeah. uh, cu culturally and contextually accepting uh, of, of that practice because uh, right. grocery delivery is not saving people money, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's saving people time. So if you're in a context where money is uh, not readily available, then your online delivery is not necessarily going to do that break. Yeah. Then if you're in, a, in the context where, well, of course, there are uh, uh, a very, very um, untrusting of financial institution and, and so forth, then again, your online grocery may not necessarily work there. But there are, of course, other countries. Mm -hmm. I heard that Amazon right now, they can't, they've, uh, they're no longer, they are delivering only essential. So the big Amazon, right, the, you know, huge mammoth, they can't even deliver everything that everyone deliver, uh, requires. So there can be some new entrants there who are going to establish footholds. Um, um, in the market and, and, you know, do, do some kind of online, online delivery to take the, the cascade that Amazon cannot afford. And if they create a good enough uh, customer experience and product market fit, they might be able to survive post-COVID. Uh, post Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, Baba, did you, would you want to jump on the real estate question? There's a real estate question there. Would you like to take that? And <laughs> okay, okay, yes. Okay, so I saw, so that's by um, Ade Piton. Ade Piton. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so, yes, so secondly, can any one of the facilitators talk about the advantage the real estate business starts to get now since it's 
appreciate. Um, so realistically, um, I believe, so, so I would say it's a personal assumption um, that what drives real estate valuation um, is commercial use. That's what drives it. Uh, so you have offices in Victoria Island. So, so I'm localizing this to, to Nigeria, for example. You have offices in Victoria Island, Ikoi, um, and these offices have commercial values because they're used for business. Um, so as the value of business properties go higher, um, you also see that the value of private properties that are in close proximity to where these businesses are located also go higher. You know, so you have a lot of offices, high rise, you know, top class offices in Ikoi, Victoria Island. And what means what that means is that private residences are also expensive, you know, because businesses are situated in those locations. Um, what I believe is that um, there might be some form of depreciation um, in the value of real estate. So um, I'm speaking to you. Um, so most likely a building is in, is in Paris. Uh, Miriam is in Finland. Ayuade is in Lagos, Nigeria. But um, as I'm speaking to you, I can as well be speaking to you from Ajegule. But you don't know, you don't care. What matters to you is the fact that we can communicate, I have internet. So what I'm saying in essence is that businesses can now say, you know what, I can get a space in somewhere less expensive and because of streaming mechanism and digital based engagement, I don't have to go and pay for an expensive office in Victoria Island. You know, um, so that is the reality I see with digitization. Um, the digital world um, as regards um, access to streaming um, um, tools might now become the expensive tools because the demand has moved, you know. So I don't know how much, you know, so Zoom, for example, has different packages. Um, if Zoom sees that there's so much demand, demand can wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to scale up the cost or the price so that I can support, you know, but that won't happen to estates, you know. So my assumption is that um, valuation of estates will go down um, because location won't matter again, um, you know, um, mm -hmm. and um, that is, um, I'm sure as we're chatting and as, ADBC, it didn't tell us where it was chatting from that I'm chatting from Victoria because it's it's sort of inconsequential, you yeah. know, with digital evolution where you are located. You know, so what matters is power internet. Um, and mm -hmm. those are the things that will take a bulk of, 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 of the cost. So if a facility is providing that that might determine the valuation of the facility. But I would assume that generally with the Nigerian scope and as regards Lagos, um, this era might give birth to some form of depreciation. So that's just my assumption. Um, but time will tell really. Thank um, you. Time will tell really. Then lastly, I don't know if you permit me, um, there was a question that Ayo responded to, um, which was about um, my question goes to Aya as regards the quote of startups being lean. So am I correct to imply that less human? So, so I think the, the, the question really was the assumption that with the birth of startups and because startups are lean, that would give birth to unemployment. Um, so I would like to I dissuade, see. yes, I would like to dissuade um, the mind of Temitayo to say that with the bet of startups, you would have more jobs. Um, so Nigeria already is an SME-driven country. Um, even those who have regular jobs have side hustles. Oh, yeah. Um, so, and you have people that they just hustle on the normal level. And what would happen is that they are also will become digitized. 
you know, so 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 that's it. And um, what a startup does is that with a team of two, three, you are able to do what um, 20 or 50 or 60, you know, so for example, in banking, you know, I would say and complain at times that why do we have too many people doing same things that startups just sit down and say, let's do, let's do, and there are tools to deliver it, you know? So I would assume that um, with the proliferation of startups um, and with the right digital education, um, it won't lead to unemployment, you know, it won't, it won't. Uh, unemployment can be caused by other factors, you know, considering the nature of our country, Nigeria, but it won't be caused by um, startups. So I, I thought I, I should add that. Okay. Th thank you, Babajide. Thank you. We're wrapping up right now, so I'm going to allow um, Tayo to also chip in um, on the real estate part and also give a closing word to all the participants, and then each panelist will take their turn on the closing word, and then we'll wrap up for tonight. So Tayo, your comments on the real estate question, and then your last word to the participants. Okay, thank you, Abiodun. Um, so um, my comment is actually on the grocery question, um, not on real estate. So um, the guy was asking about, you know, um, was asking about, you know, what would be the future of grocery delivery and all of that. And um, I quite appreciate um, Miriam's uh, position on that, which of course is true. Um, you have to always know along the lines you're innovating. So your innovation could be along the lines of time or along the lines if you're innovating. And that's why, you know, when we started, I really spoke about people that ultimately is not about your product, it's not about your service, it's about the people. What do people want? And that's along the lines you innovate. So I want to also add for this person, because I'm thinking that this person might actually be operating in this area, that along the, the lines along, along which you could innovate to position yourself will now be, of course, because we're thinking about costs and all of that, will now be about you. Can you do bulk buying and deliveries? such that people subscribe to your groceries, like on a weekly basis, yeah. you buy in bulk and then you deliver to people. So you would have solved the problem of cost because by buying in yeah. bulk, you drop down um, the cost and then you can even buy from farm, you know, so you can do things like buy. And this is free business idea you're getting right here. You know, so you buy from the, you directly from the farm and then you have subscriptions. People who are subscribed to what you're doing on a weekly basis, and then they buy from you and you deliver. So that way you've dropped down their cost and you've dropped down time. So you've done two things. You've used one stone to actually kill two birds. So on my last word, um, I think first of all, I'd like to thank you so much, um, Dom, uh, the Dom himself for doing this, you know, so because, you know, uh, so um, I think it was last week or last two weeks back, we had our Andre women creating a better Africa, which we announced. We had 100 women across Africa, you know, and all of that. And I've actually been thinking of bringing them like this, bringing the women, because you have great women. You have Gambisa Moyo. You have, uh, you know, many of them like that on the team, you know, doing amazing things. And I want them to come on board like this and also share, you know, but, you know, the children running Elta Skelta. I don't know how people are doing it. All, and they're always <laughs> hungry. Hungry all the time. They want to eat. So they don't you know that they're getting like, <laughs> <laughs> they, are not, they are not in tune with what is happening. They just know that they have time to watch TV. You know, Bing, watch TV. Is it Bing or Bing? I don't even know. You know, so on my last words, I like to say that um, I like to share the quick story of question box. You know, and that will just help to open up because this time presents a lot of opportunity. And, you know, I also run a startup myself. Um, and so, you know, one time I went for one, um, one competition and they said, oh, you seem to, when I spoke, they said, you, you seem to be very like you, you have it all together. I said, and they said, the business seems to be very mature. I said, I am the mature one. So please give me that opportunity. I need it as well. So, you know, so all of us are thinking about it. And like somebody said on the panel that we're all going to learn together. Nobody has been through this before. 
it's a road we've never passed, you know. And uh, Babaji just said it very clearly that those who actually experience the influenza, yeah, most of them are gone. So we can't even ask them that oh, what happened, how do you go through it? So, like I said, I want to talk about the story of question box and how innovation can come about. So I don't know how many of us are familiar with question, but I've forgotten the name of the lady now. I'll look for it. But, you know, so it's an organization that brings, um, you know, so Google, they know that. So they were thinking, okay, we want to increase digital literacy for people. And they thought about, okay, let's increase digital literacy for rural people and all of that. But they thought about, okay, first of all, um, we need to give them computers. Okay, maybe that's not so difficult. Then we need to get them locked onto the internet. With, um, internet. So we need to provide them data. Okay, maybe that's not so bad. And I said, okay, now we need to provide them information. Okay, well, that's still cool. But now we need to provide them information in their own languages. And they were like, ah, this process of getting information to digital literacy to people is so long. So what did they do? They put those systems somewhere and then they created like sort of a call center where people in the, you can just like, you know, the call phone that people just come to, you just press a button and then you can ask the question. And then there's somebody in front of a computer. So the guy asks the question and says, oh, how do I, um, how long does it take um, a chick or um, eggs to hatch or something like that? Then there's somebody who goes on Google ask Google that question, and of course, their language, you know, you have selected your language, and then they say, okay, so, um, and then they answer them and say, it takes um, um, 21 days, I still remember my Greek, it takes 21 days for um, the eggs to hatch. So what I might say, innovation comes from anywhere, and it's not boxed. Let's not be boxed in our thinking. Let's open up our minds and know that this isn't, you know, in my article, I wrote something, I said, this, this COVID has tested um, the, the, you know, it has brought to bear, it has, it has, brought, it has brought to fear to for the weaknesses of nations. You see, look at everywhere, there's, the challenges are everywhere. Some are having more than others, but it has brought it up. So everyone has um, their challenges. Every nation has it. So let's settle down at this point. Let's be innovative around what we're doing. And let's tell ourselves that we can actually make the most of this time, reinvent ourselves and build businesses um, that, will, that will be sustainable um, in the long term. Thank you very Beautiful. much. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you Tayo. Revenge yourself, build sustainable businesses. Um, so, Mr. Okwe, one last word for the audience. Okay, my last word is that um, the audience is made up of startups uh, and SMEs. Um, most of yeah. us, we are young people, you know, and the key to Sussex is taking uh, advantage of uh, opportunity, you know. Uh, right now, we are dealing with COVID-19. This is not the end of the world. A lot of people are predicting this is the end of the world. No matter what's happening to you right now, happening to your business, your ideas, and all, this is not the end of the world, okay? The world is going to move ahead from this. Don't listen to what everybody has said here today and just, you know, go back to not doing something, okay? Try to make use of what you have listened to today and continue doing your own research so that when this world doesn't come to an end after COVID-19, you're actually prepared for what is going to come next, you know? Yeah, so keep yourself, please. Don't, uh, in Yoruba, they say, Malo Suede. I don't know if you are Yoruba, but, uh, <laughs> so just, <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Tokwe. Thank you, Tokwe. Um, Ayo Dawodu, last word. Yeah, my last word. Uh, I mean, for the businesses, business owners on the call, uh, what I would say is, like, this is the time to try things. This is the time to push out whatever innovations you might be thinking out. Um, have the mind, mindset of failing fast for you to succeed faster. So it doesn't matter if things are not perfect now. But what, what is more important is getting feedback from the things you are trying within this period. So that's, that's, the tap, that's the information you get that will sort of inform um, the decisions and actions post-COVID. Uh, for individuals, uh, probably maybe you're employed. This is the time to learn. There are several platforms online where you can learn free courses. Avad is re releasing all their courses for free. Like right now, there's just an explosion of digital content. And so you don't want to be caught Netflixing and chilling all day. You want to be actually be learning and building your capacity because when the com company is downsizing, they're going to look at those 
who are bringing value to the table. And if within the two weeks or four weeks period, there's not any improvement, maybe that might just be a criteria they were used to sort of shed, shed the load, right? So we want to be sure that you're bringing value to the table. And I hope we all keep safe and um, keep up our life during this period. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maximize the period. Thank you. Um, Miriam? Yes. Um, really, really um, excellent discussion uh, from everyone. Learned so much and uh, really great to see the, the question and the engagement. I truly hope that um, the startups who will leave from here will leave with something immediately applicable that they can use to transform their business. I think that's what we hope for here. Uh, that you you be the one or will be the one to really capture the value in this um, in this time that we're living in. You know, one of the <laughs> great thing, <laughs> if there could be a great thing in the middle of this COVID-19, is that um, it is the it is in a way the great equalizer. You know, all over the world, everyone's facing the same enemy and everyone's struggling. And I think this presents an opportunity. It, in a way, Nigeria is a startup if you compare it to the other, because other countries have their own, they're suffering from the curse of efficiency. You know, uh, they have their own system and now they need to start rethinking and, and mobilizing against this. And, you know, it's very expensive and costly uh, to do that. But where in a sense, we can start from the scratch. You know, we can look at our education system and say, this is what we want to do. Uh, we can look at our healthcare and say that, you know what, this is where we need to be, uh, are to be resilient. And I really love that idea, that thought that you brought up very much, that not, not just surviving, you know, but thriving uh, uh, through this and for generations to come. So this gives us an opportunity, not only as a country, but also as uh, entrepreneurs who are here. Uh, we've talked about a lot of interesting ideas, and I think that uh, many people can already start thinking that this is what I could invest my time in. You know, this is a company that I could, uh, I could build um, I personally, I have all of my own passions. I'm, I know that we said let entrepreneurs not be in love with the idea. I'm a little bit in love, <laughs> in love with my, with, I think it will save the world. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, um, but at the same time, I think that, you know, the, I, the, the, the financial sector digitalization that you've talked about, these are opportunities for startups. And some, you know, you mentioned earlier, they may talk about that uh, private sector investors are not interested, but guess what? You know, their analysts are telling them also where the future is going to be, you know, and if they find any startup who is, who is capturing that, they will open up the, uh, they will open up the wallet. So this is also time for uh, those opportunities that we should take advantage of them. And in terms of uh, uh, the collaboration, I, it, you know, I, I don't live in Nigeria and I haven't uh, been in Nigeria in four years, maybe. Last time was in 2016 when I was working there. Um, and so for me hearing about all this initi initiative, I think the collaboration can also start from here, here as well. That's uh, we have talked about all this great idea and I know that we love our country very, very much. And we see, we, we really see, I think the people here really see that we can really make a difference and we can really transform the na nation now as the right opportunity to do that. So we can start from here also combining forces and thinking about, you know, what can we do? Uh, one idea that has very much been on my mind for a while, uh, which I think Michael Porter speaks about very strongly, is creating center of excellence. You know, so what are we going to be known for as a nation? What is that industry that we can create now, right? Can you imagine that uh, um, India is the greatest source of paracetamol in the world? You know, if they lock down, no paracetamol <laughs> well, for everyone, you know. What is yeah. the thing that we can own as a nation? Now people are being laid off, so there's a lot of human capital and human yeah. resources, both locally and globally. Uh, many of our, no company has been, well, most companies have not been immune to this situation. So there's a lot of layoff in really huge uh, global company as well of top, top talent. You know, how yeah. can those talent be like captured 
we, we have th we have this now. We have all these resources now. You know, Babajide, you are talking about all the great DFID fund that is available to to tap into things. And and I know Google is very eager to support local industry creation and all that. What is then the Let's put this innovative thinking to bear. You know, I, I believe yeah. very much in the in the power of doing one thing and doing well, as I said, and starting from small things. You know, that yeah. take all these resources, take all the cap these capabilities. What can we start that we can Thank water? You. That in the next ten years we can look back and say, you know, this was the uh, you know Google or the Airbnb that was born in the recession time oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we have now created. So, so this is uh, something that I want to share. And as the other you were saying, I really connected very much on the like children thing. <laughs> and so, you know, my son has been sleeping so wonderfully. <laughs> wonderfully tonight i've been looking behind me to see you know if they're going to come in here uh at, so, at some point you know but yeah I, I i felt that very much in my soul uh but i liked very much as a practical thing the idea that she said you know about the young the women in this this 100 i think you should do that absolutely you know that you don't have to do it all alone i believe that you'll find a lot of people who have time on their hands right now to plan and execute and think about it the impact now of most events is so much bigger because it's not tied to a physical location so yeah. everyone all over the world you know are sitting at home and looking for really meaningful content and if that's one thing that can be contributed you know to this um uh uh situation to the minds of young women across the across the continent and across the world then then that's something worth doing and you should right. absolutely Go for it. Okay, Thank I think you, I have a volunteer. You already, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's volunteering. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have, I, I have a little bit of time now for exciting things. <laughs> All right, Babaji, the last word, and then I. Uh, yeah. Okay, so once again, um, Biodo. Thanks for organizing this. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, so very valid and important. Um, feedback we've shared um, and I do hope that for all the attendees um, they'll find our information um, and our insight very valuable. Um, what I would just say is let's just keep being positive um, let's consistently feed our mind um, with the right content and right form of information okay. um, from there um, innovation can bust out um, and um, from this kind of season, I'm very confident that it's going to bring up some positives. Yeah. Um, some startups will die, some businesses will die, um, but new businesses will come we'll up, yeah. um, new businesses will emerge. Um, so I think it's just the way of the world um, rebuilding itself. Um, and I know businesses too, would sort of um, rebet and reemerge. Um, yeah. So I'm positive that um, things would be good, would get better, um, and I hope for the best for everyone here today. Um, and let's just keep trusting, you know, in the supreme being. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, you, thanks. And the last word from Ayode, over to you. Uh, thank you, Biodo. Fantastic session. Uh, thanks all the speakers. I really learned from all you guys. Uh, thanks to the 28, actually, every all the attendees and the 27 that, that have stayed, stayed behind. The <laughs> last one <You> standing. <laughs> you guys are the real rock stars. Um, final words from myself. Um, one of my favorite authors, Ben Horowitz, talks about two kinds of CEOs, the peacetime CEOs and the wartime CEOs. The peacetime CEOs are the guys when things are going great, everybody's raising rounds and funding, and you know everybody's happy, all is good in the hood. Uh, but this is the time for the wartime CEOs, right? Um, and for every startup, now is the time to dial up your wartime heart. This means that you need to be efficient, you need to be precise, and you need to be mission focused, right? Think like a soldier in, in a military, you know, on, on the field, on the battleground, right? You are, you're very focused on surviving and achieving your mission. I think that's where every CEO and startup founder's head needs to be at. Um, I think crisis like this purifies the system. 
um, yeah. you know, it takes away bad businesses and bad business models and, mm -hmm. you know, rewards those that stay after. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for, you know, the real businesses that have really good value to offer. Um, so, you know, do everything you can to prove your business and your business value. You know, um, if you make it past this difficult period, you'd have less competition, you'll be more resilient as a business and as in, an individual, and you'll be in a stronger position. Um, I think three strategies to deploy, and I'll be very fast. Number one is short-term defense. This is now and the next two to three months, right? This time you want to focus on surviving, reducing your bond rates, preserving your cash runway, um, say yes to every opportunity you find during this period. The mm -hmm. ones that you can deliver on, do it. The ones that you can't, outsource it, right? Give it to a friend. You guys collaborate on it, get a percentage of referral from that and, and keep it. And if that kind of referrals or jobs keeps coming to you, then that's a potential business opportunity, right? So in the short term, defense, try to survive. Mm -hmm. Three to six months time is mid-term mitigation, right? This is where you want to focus on painkillers um, rather than vitamins, right? So what needs do people have? What needs can I feel? Um, I think it was Miriam that talked about your resources and your capabilities. Find what those are and find how you can deploy it to solve needs. Um, going back to Iodal, those lean startup, you know, you want to talk to users, build MVPs really quickly, test it out in the market, iterate, pivot if you need to, um, but always act strategically and quick. And then in the long term, um, focus on creating real value for customers, right? Identify problems, solve the problems. Um, one point is we should all, as startup founders, think about creating businesses with strong fundamentals, right? Um, I know very early on, you probably don't have profits, um, but still have your key financial metrics, you know, very close to you. Things like your asset turnover ratio. Do I know how well my assets are generating revenues for me, right? My equity ratio, my solvency ratios have three, four key ratios that are tracking and tells you how well you're doing as a startup, tells you when you cross over the line of profitability and how well you're growing, such that when there are future crises, you can survive them, you can adapt and you can grow. Um, mm -hmm. And then don't give up, you know, find a way to survive, um, find a way to thrive, find a way to beat this and win. That's why you are, you are an entrepreneur. In closing, somebody asked for book recommendations. I'll recommend two. The mm -hmm. first is Only the Paranoid Survive by Andy Groove, fantastic book. I've read it before, I'm rereading it again. It was written in 1988, and it talks about strategic inflection points that the world goes through and how companies can survive. Again, yeah. how um, only the paranoid survive. And then second book, Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. Also fantastic book, I'd recommend that. So again, thank you everyone. And you know, I hope we all, you know, as individuals as well, get through this um, period, you know, healthy, our families, etc. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much. I think what a powerful closing bit. So I want to say thank you to all our speakers. Ayode, Google, thank you, Miriam from Finland. Thank you, Babaji, Dave, CMB, Temita, Perfect Labs, Ayoda, Odo, Loyster. Thank you, Temita, you for good. Thank you so much for all the participants. So I want to say thank you for taking out time, you know, to be able to be part of this. I'll just close with one final statement I saw from Warren Buffett, who just had an interview, and we're asking him about his own perceptions regarding the COVID-19 thing on Yahoo Finance. And this is what he has to say, is there will be interruptions and I don't know when they will occur. That's talking about post-COVID now. He's also saying, I don't know how deep these disruptions and these interruptions will occur. But what I do know is that they would start occurring from time to time, these disruptions. And I also know that we'll come out of this better at the end of the day. So he's saying it's time for disruptions. It's time for innovative ideas to flourish. And what he's sure about is these disruptive ideas would make the world a better place and they would be the ones who would be the, you know, the beneficiaries of this pandemic. So I want to say thank you everybody for taking time to join. I'll send um, the contact details on LinkedIn, um, the LinkedIn contact details of all our panelists via email, also attaching the recording for the video. So for all of you who have registered, so you'll be getting an email that has to do with, you know, their LinkedIn profile. So you can actually, you know, direct your messages to them and follow up with them subsequently. So I want to say thank you everybody for making our time. Um, this means a lot to us and um, wish you a wonderful evening um, wherever you are in any part of the world from Africa to Eastern Europe to, I can see some friends from Canada too. Um, so I want to wish you a very lovely evening. Thank you so much and um, let's keep safe.
Yes, thank you and have a good night, everyone. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank Thanks. you, Viona. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. You. Cheers. Keep safe. Cheers. Take care. Good night.